Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today I told my daughter that we're only paying for four years of college and she's not happy about it. My wife and I are well off and we're very grateful for it. We have four kids and this is about our third kid, Bella. We have a rule for college and the rule is that you need to get your degree in four years. We will pay for it and if you graduate earlier, we'll give you extra money for your own use. For example, my oldest graduated in four years and had no debt. My second oldest graduated early. They took summer classes and we gave him money that he is using for a down payment on a home. If they're doing a five-year program, we will pay. But if they leave that program for a normal one, then it goes back to four. Now, Bella has changed her major twice already and she's a junior right now. She told us that she's changing her major again. I reminded her that we're only paying for four years. This is where we got into an argument. She's upset that we won't pay even though we have the cash. My argument is that we had already told her and we're not going to change it now. By the end of it, she called me an unsupportive parent slash jerk and says that I'm having her go into debt for pursuing her passion. Am I the jerk? She won't talk to me at the moment. This is your daughter we're talking about. If you can afford it, you should pay. I'm going with everyone sucks here. I don't understand how anyone could just let their kid drown in debt just because she's not sure about her future. I feel sorry for her. I know stressing over money and debt while my parents are well off enough to have helped would hurt me. Also, why would her siblings be upset? It isn't about them. They already got everything they need and more. And less time too. Good for them. What does your wife think? Why is Bella changing majors again? Has she shown that she's not applying herself or that she's a good student? Because she changed her major doesn't mean she won't have enough credits to graduate. She will have bigger workload, but that doesn't mean she can't do it. She should speak to an advisor. I don't think you're a jerk because you reminded her, but it seems like the priority should be Bella finds success and is happy with her degree choice. She can still get this done in four years. If money is your priority, then Bella needs to understand how she can either graduate on time or how much it will cost her for loans. Maybe she won't switch her degree. No jerks here. OP. My wife is annoyed with her. She's a B student for the most part. She didn't like what she is doing, so that's why she's changing. She won't have enough credits since she needs to make up for the sophomore classes for the new major. She is literature right now and she's jumping to data collection. You're the jerk. Don't be surprised when your daughter goes no contact with you. Why do rich people who can afford to pay for their kids college insist on being selfish and greedy with their money? Did you decide to bring your daughter into the world? Yes. So then why are you cheaping out on paying for her college education? You as parents owe your kid at least a college education as the bare minimum. The bar is set so low, yet parents will always find a way to fail their kids. If you loved your daughter, you would have no problem paying for her education, no matter what, even if it means taking out loans for her because that's what a good parent would do. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I think that last comment has got more issues than Time Magazine. Am I the jerk for asking my husband to not eat lunch at night? We're a one income family. We have a 10 year old and a baby who's under one. I don't and can't work due to health and chronic pain issues. My husband works full time, usually 35 to 40 hours a week. When I cook dinner, I make enough so my husband has leftovers to take to work the next day. He has the habit of eating what's supposed to be in his lunch as a large nighttime snack before bed. We have plenty of stuff he can snack on or heat up that's not his lunch for the next day. Then he ends up eating out instead and he hates fast food so he spends $20 to $25 on lunch each day that he eats his lunch as a snack. This adds up and makes money tighter for us. I get it's his income but it's affecting the entire family. I've asked him to not eat his lunch as a snack but he says he loves my cooking and can't help it and I should feel complimented he enjoys it so much. But I also like knowing that our bills will all be paid and we can afford gas, groceries, household supplies, and stuff for the kids without being in the red each week. Am I the jerk? Edit. If I make more for dinner, he will have third or fourth helpings. I do the grocery shopping and I try to get everything I can on his snack list. He will still eat his lunch as a snack. Hubby is a recovering gambling addict and currently owes $100,000 in back taxes that I'm trying to also budget to pay towards each month. He currently works in retail, making around 40 k a year. He has a master's in economics and used to make 200000 But some bad decisions in life messed that up and he ended up in legal trouble and can no longer work in his former industry. Not the jerk. 
Having been in this position, the only thing that worked was sitting my husband down and actually showing him the numbers. Say he's eating out three times a week. That's $60 to $75 per week, or $240 to $300 per month, $2,800 to $3,600 per year. Girl, that's a family vacation that he's eating. That's a full month or more rent or mortgage, simply because he won't save dinner leftovers for lunch and stop eating out. Lay out the actual cost of his snacking and give him a reality shock. It might help put things into perspective for him. Good luck. And also, why can't your husband make something for his lunch if he's eaten the leftovers at night? This right here. He has the impulse control of a kid, so he eats the yummy things at night. So why isn't he then taking something else for lunch instead of wasting their money buying lunch? There are a decent amount of people in this thread expecting OP to cook more and portion it out and hide it away to deal with him being selfish. Why is he allowed daily takeout they can't afford but OP isn't? There is absolutely zero reason he should be eating out with that much debt owed. Also, he should learn some self-control. All these suggestions of portioning out two meals, just no. This grown man needs to learn to restrain his impulsivity and leave his homemade lunch alone. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for not wanting to name my baby after my late mother-in-law? I'm five months pregnant with me and my husband's daughter. And we can't agree on a name for the baby. Like, we can't even sit down and make a list of names to consider. My husband keeps insisting that he wants our daughter to be named after his mom. Her fake name was Mildred, so our daughter would get bullied for having an old lady name, since that's just how kids are and will always be. He keeps saying we can just call her Millie and would still be on the roll call as Mildred. Not only that, but Mildred was horrible to me. She was sweet as sugar around everyone, but as soon as it was the two of us, she was the cruelest person imaginable and made it abundantly clear that she despised me. I don't want to name my daughter after a woman who hated me from day one. My husband has never believed me when I told him how Mildred treated me and thought that it was just a normal thing for a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law to disagree and that I was just over-exaggerating. He and Mildred were very close. He visits her all the time, calls all the time, everything. Towards the end, he had visited her multiple times a week in the hospital, usually for hours at a time. He'd go straight to her after work and stayed until he was told to leave. Her passing really took a toll on him, so I understood that he wants to honor her, but I can't ignore how she treated me when he wasn't around. I feel like I'm losing my mind. My husband doesn't want to call our daughter anything but Mildred, and I want to call her anything other than Mildred. Am I the jerk? Edit. My husband won't compromise. He doesn't want Mildred as a middle name. His reasoning is that no one cares about middle names and that since it won't be in her first name, it won't really be honoring her. At least not enough since Mildred is our daughter's grandmother and not a great aunt or something. Not the jerk, but your husband is for denying your feelings. Here's a question I haven't seen yet. Did your mother-in-law even like the name Mildred? OP. She liked everything the old-fashioned way so I'd assume so. I never asked if she liked her name. She passed a few years back, before me and my husband seriously considered if and when we wanted to have kids. I would die on this hill, as Mildred is an ugly and old-fashioned name. The fact he doesn't believe you about how she treated you alone is a huge red flag, and honestly, I would give your husband a wake-up call and let him read all the comments. Please tell your husband it is not normal for a daughter-in-law and mother-in-law to always argue or disagree. Most well-adjusted people understand boundaries and try not to overstep, apologize when they do, and try their best to get along. He sounds like he was a mama's boy, and it was her passing that finally cut the strings. I would bet he never supported you when disagreements occurred. If you're willing to agree to Mildred as a middle name, he should be happy. It's an old-fashioned name, and teachers often call out kids by their full name, at least at first. This is a hill I would die on. You had a bad relationship with her. That name is just off your list, so it cannot be considered. Not the jerk. Update. We found a compromise. It took me having to track down an ex to tell him that Mildred wasn't all sugar and spice and everything nice, but he finally understood and we had a long talk. He still wanted to call the baby Mildred, but agreed it was a little too old. We compromised on Amelia, with Millie for short, so that there's still an homage to Mildred as they were very close. I'm ready to pop and we're happier than ever. Unsatisfying Redditor Updates what the heck? Why does X's thoughts have more validity than his wife's? I understand that it helped her case with the name, but major marinara flags all around. OP's husband doesn't have respect for her. Today I messed up by stalking my husband's Reddit account. 
When we met and the entire three years we dated before we married, I was always firm about not wanting kids. My husband told me that his stance on kids was along the lines of kind of undecided, but overall not a good idea. Always said he used to want kids, but changed his mind later in life. I wholeheartedly believed him until I decided to snoop. We're both pretty avid Reddit users, and he wanted to brag to me about how many upvotes one of his comments had. I watched him as he clicked on his profile to find it, and I caught his username and a glimpse of another comment where it looked like he was talking about me. We've never tried hiding each other's accounts from one another, so it's not like his was secret, but I still feel a little bad for letting curiosity get the best of me. I looked up his username later in the day to check out what he had to say about me. To his credit, he was gushing about me, and it was really sweet. But quite a few of his other comments also talked about how he wished he could have kids of his own, and that the only thing stopping him is me. Talks about how his desire to be with me outmatches his desire to have kids, but he's still heartbroken that he can't have both. I still don't know what to make of it. On one hand, I'm hurt that in the almost 10 years we've been together, he's never talked to me about this, and instead lied to make it seem like we were on the same page. I feel immense guilt that I've taken such a choice away from him, especially after reading about just how badly he wants it. On the other hand, and I can't believe I'm about to type this out, it's making me rethink my stance. For the first time in my 32 years of existence, I'm uncertain about whether I want kids or not. I've always thought pregnancy and birth sounds like a nightmare, and I simply don't have the mental bandwidth to devote all of my time to raising a kid but suddenly I am having daydreams about it all. Just last night I fell asleep while thinking about what would happen if my birth control failed and we decided to just roll with it instead of getting rid of it. Every argument I try to come up with against it is easily refuted by how our life is currently going. We own a house, we both have good jobs that pay well, and I work from home on my own schedule so we wouldn't have to worry about daycare or extended maternity leave. The fact that I'm even reconsidering is absolutely terrifying. What if I think on it for another year, decide to go for it, and then regret it? What if I'm only thinking about it now because I want to make him happy? What if I decide to ignore these thoughts and later regret not trying before we get too old? What if he thinks he wants me now, but later resents me for not letting him live the life he's always wanted? I regret looking into his Reddit account. I wish I could go back to a few days ago where this wasn't on my mind and I thought things were going great between us. I'm sorry if this isn't as interesting as today I messed up by hooking up with someone's mom or whatever usually gets popular. I just needed to get all of this off my chest. To address a few things I've seen mentioned by you guys. 1. Don't worry, I'm not throwing out my birth control tonight and jumping straight to baby making. I'm honestly still leaning more into the not having kids side. And if my mind changes more, it's still not happening until we both want one without a shadow of a doubt. 2. Just talk to him, communicate. I appreciate the concern, but keeping it to myself forever was never an option for me. Our communication is usually fantastic and I'm planning on sitting down with him. I was just panicking a bit while writing this and wasn't sure the when, how, or what, how I'd like to share it with him. 3. Why do you think doing the same thing he did will solve your problems? You know what? You got me there. I'll probably show him this post eventually anyway, so I'm not sure how much water these comments hold, but you may be right that I shouldn't have shared this with strangers on the internet. I will say though, I kind of get why people do it now. To quote one of my own comments, it's like having a sea of little angels and devils on your shoulder, which to be honest is a little cool and almost cathartic. Update. Okay, I started out by saying, don't freak out, this isn't anything super serious, it's just me being classic Jane. I then went on to explain that I was extremely sorry for invading his privacy, but that I looked up his account and read some of his comments, and he interrupted me by laughing. He didn't just laugh. He saw what a wreck I was, and he had the audacity to guffaw loud enough to startle me. He then said, So, that was you. You guys were right. He found my original post. I feel silly for thinking he wouldn't, but I figured it wouldn't get as popular as it did, and between him spending most of the day at work instead of on Reddit, and saying he wasn't a fan of subreddits like these, that he would somehow miss it. In my defense, I had changed enough details about our lives that he wasn't totally sure until I told him I found his account. But yeah, he had his suspicions. He set me down at this point and basically said, I know you well enough to know you don't actually want kids. This is just a phase. I won't go into details because it's pretty personal, but he presented his arguments for why he thinks that and he is 100% right. He then followed up with, I don't think you interpreted what I wrote correctly. He doesn't want to share his account with everyone, so I won't copy and paste the comment. But when he wrote that he loved me more than he wanted to have kids, he didn't mean that he was giving up that life just to make me happy. 
He meant that being with me completely changed his outlook. Us being together meant that we could travel anywhere we want together, have romantic dates where we stay out as late as we want, do things at 4 a.m. without having to worry about being too loud or waking anyone up. He realized that he doesn't want kids when he married me because he didn't want to share our life together with anyone else. When I asked him why he said he felt heartbroken that he couldn't have both, he explained that he didn't articulate that comment very well. He wasn't necessarily heartbroken that he could never have kids of his own, but rather he was grieving the loss of his imaginary kids and a mentality he held on to for his entire life up until he changed his mind. I imagine it felt a little bit like my freakout in the original post where I was scared and confused. Anyway, everything went smoothly and we decided by the end of our conversation to stick without having kids. But we'll regularly check in with each other about in case we ever change our minds. I went to serve in the military for one month and came back to find my girlfriend had changed. For context, OP lives in Turkey. Normally, military service is six months, but there was a law passed in 2019 that allowed for one month service with a payment of 31,000 Turkish lira, about 1,130 US dollars. Me and my girlfriend have been dating for two years. I was planning to propose in the next three months and I was extremely sure that she was going to say yes as we've been planning our lives together. She was hinting that I should propose by sending me cheeky proposal posts, signaling that she wants an engagement ring on her finger and she sometimes would say, when we get married. We live together. Admittedly, we started fast and rushed into things. We started living together a month into our relationship. We've been living together ever since. She was always so loving with me. This is the best relationship I've ever had. She always made me feel loved, cared for, and even if she is somewhat selfish by nature, she always put me first. And she loves me very much, and I love her very much. I have been the perfect boyfriend. I kept taking her out on dates, giving her gifts, helping her around the house, solving her problems, and giving her affection and care. We never fought, not even once. But then things changed. I had to go and serve in the military for a month. She dropped me off at the bus station, kissed me, hugged me, cried, said that she loves me and would miss me a lot, etc. While I was in the military, she sent me texts saying how much she missed me and how she cared for me a lot, speaking in a loving manner. After about four days though, she stopped. During the month, we barely spoke and only when I called. She sent me 20 texts at least. When I came back, she came to welcome me. She was very distant. She didn't even seem happy that I was back. Everything felt so off about her. We went back to our home and I asked what was wrong and why she was acting this way. We spoke about it for hours and she said that during my absence, she realized that she had too much love and wanted to cool off a bit. She said we rushed into things and she wants me to move out as she was not ready for this kind of life where we live together. She said that she wanted to live a little and not do everything together. She wanted to go on dates with me and experience the things we haven't experienced because we immediately moved in together. She wants to go out and have fun on her own too and she wants the space for herself, her own order of things. She's studying medicine and she's in her last year and she wants to focus more on that too. I said okay, I'll move out, but I don't feel like this explains her being so distant. I asked if there was somebody else and she said no. She said that she only wants to live her life like a 24-year-old and not a 30-year-old. I don't keep her from dressing the way she wants to and I don't get jealous when she goes out with her friends, but I understand that me being there 24-7 can make her feel burnt out. She said she loves me and wants to keep working on the relationship and everything will be better for us this way. But I kind of feel icky about this. I feel like our relationship is dying. Everything changed so fast and she doesn't even say I love you back when I say it. I feel like there's a distance between us all the time. I got a house and I'm moving out tomorrow. I canceled my plans to propose and I'm ready to take it slow like she wants to. I feel like this can break us though. Can our relationship survive this? Why can this happen? What's the outlook? You were absent for a month which could have triggered some abandonment wounds and left her feeling like she needs to focus on being there for herself. It isn't your fault. It sounds like she's still figuring out how she feels. Give her time, treat her kindly, and have compassion. She just went through a lot. OP, that's another possibility. The month of me being absent coincided with the start of her internship, during which she was extremely busy, would never eat, even had a patient die in her care. It seems to me her affection and sweetness is coming back, and I hope everything stays well. Whether there's someone else or not, she's making it clear she doesn't want to be with you. She's just trying to be nice about it by saying you can still work it out. Take the hint. Move out and move on. It sucks for a two-year relationship to end, but life goes on, and I promise you will meet someone else even better at some point. 
It's better to end things in two years instead of being in an unhappy relationship for 10 years. You're in a relationship for two years. You go away for a month of military training. After four days of your absence, she realizes she's been making a mistake with you for the past two years and wants to revert to the early stages of dating. While you're going through what I'm assuming is stressful training, the communication slows to a trickle. My friend, this is a tale as old as time. I'm a senior non-commissioned officer in the US Army and I'm here to tell you there's a significant likelihood Jody got your girl. Who's Jody? Jody is the person who messes around with your significant other while you're gone. Jody's gender is irrelevant. Sometimes Jody has been waiting for the opportunity to pounce and sometimes your significant other has been waiting for an opportunity to open the door for Jody. Many soldiers get the Dear John letter while they're in initial training or deployed away from home and Jody is often a catalyst in the significant other's decision to end things. It could be worse. Sometimes your significant other empties your bank account and lets Jody drive your car and use your stuff. It's entirely possible that there's nobody else, but I'll bet a dollar she starts dating another person in less than 45 days. Maybe she'll tell you she doesn't want to be exclusive anymore. Maybe she won't. Update. She said, I love you, unprompted, the evening of the day that I made this post. I thought this was my go sign and I started up a conversation about our relationship. It was a really good talk. She was honest and I could feel it. I will be honest with you too. To address the obvious thought everyone had, I thought she could have cheated as well, but nothing like that happened. She has made it clear that she didn't cheat in a respectable, clear way and tone, and I'm convinced she didn't. I trust this without any doubts now. Although all of the comments about Jody made me laugh, I needed a good laugh. This being a soft breakup was my other concern. I asked her if she considered breaking up with me, and she said the thought came into her mind but she didn't want to as she loves me and was sure that she would love the future we will have. She didn't want a life without me. I asked if me moving out will eventually lead to a breakup and she said she doesn't think it will, that she thinks it will only make us stronger. The problem was, as it turns out, that I went from being a happy person to someone who was worrying and depressed. She only realized this was the case when I was gone and I wasn't around to spread negativity anymore. She said that she fell in love with me because I was happy and eccentric. She mentioned that while I was doing things that a good boyfriend would do, she felt I was doing them out of duty and that I used to be very excited about buying her flowers. But lately, when I came home with flowers, I didn't celebrate this small occasion with her. I just gave them to her and went to bed. I admit, I have been very sulky these past few months. I was always worrying about my career, finances, and not being able to accomplish my future goals. I had already realized this while I was serving and worked through it myself. I think I'm in a better place now and she says she saw that I am. Her solution to this was me moving out. My negative energy, I wasn't aware it was so contagious, wouldn't affect her anymore. Because it did, and she already has a lot to worry about. She needs a positive attitude to stay strong, and I was making that harder. She also realized that we were too codependent and too much in a routine. She thought me moving out would solve this. I agree. We both were very independent people at the start, but then we got lost in love. I was always waiting for her to come home, and she was always waiting for me to do anything. This ordeal made life somehow stale. She realized that because I did so much for her, she became heavily dependent on me to solve her problems, making her feel weak and incapable. Because of this reliance, she even had a hard time paying the bill and this got to her. She missed her old self, the one with confidence and power. I realized that I lost myself too. I was a social person who commonly took the initiative to do something, with a lot of flash and crash in my life. I lost that. I lost friends and I lost my active lifestyle. She wants to go out with her friends and not include me in everything. She wants to not worry about the things she says while with friends because I might be uncomfortable with it. She wants to sometimes take long walks alone. She doesn't want to ask me every time she wants to buy something. She doesn't want to feel guilty when her day-to-day -day plans don't include me. A problem some of you may have big issues with. She admitted that she received flirtatious male attention when doing her internship at school. I wasn't surprised as she is very good looking and with a feminine personality to boot. She says she would never cheat on me and didn't want to respond to anything. Never considered anyone else but me in her life, but she liked it. She enjoyed the ego boost and that made her feel guilty. Guilty that she could like such a thing while I was away facing hardship. I said it was normal to like attention from the opposite gender, especially when you're lonely. I appreciated that she immediately tried to shut down advances and stayed committed and loyal to me. I don't think this will be a problem and she looked very relieved when I thought it wasn't a big deal. In the end, she said that she missed the old me, the one that was happy and excited. Look, y'all need to break up, dude. Just come on, man. Come on. This really bothers me. I'm glad you both worked it out 
but I hate the way she treated you. Instead of talking to you, she became cold and distant. That's awful. Instead of being there to support your emotional issue about concerns of your life, she asked you to move out. That's awful. Instead of just saying, let's hang out without each other and with our own respective friends, she asked you to move out. The better solution is to just do those things she's bothered by. There's no reason she can't go out with her friends without you. There's no reason she can't just pay a bill. You're far too trusting and she's out of touch with herself at best. You don't move out your long-term partner, enjoy the attention of others, and admit you want to hang out with friends without thinking about what you're saying, respecting your partner, because you want to work on your relationship. You both are just drawing out your breakup pretty clearly. She just wants to be single. I just hope she has the integrity to end things if she comes to that realization herself instead of messing you around or becoming manipulative. OP. I can see how it's not positive, but at the moment, I think I'll ride this out. I'll be prepared if it doesn't work out. But currently, we're okay, and I love her. That's reason enough. People are saying that she'll cheat on me, and she wants to live the single life. I don't think so. I was supposed to move out today, but she asked me to stay. Of course you're right. She didn't support me during a time where I needed support the most. But I can see her perspective. When I did go through a tough time, she was with me. She did support me then. She really made an effort, which is why I can understand she could be tired of the whole thing when I was away. If we do break up, that's fine. I'm a young man and I can handle some heartbreak if it comes my way in the future. No reason to abandon someone you just love to avoid that. If we don't, that's amazing. But I want to work on this and as long as she does too, hopefully we'll end up building a better relationship for the both of us. Karen demanded I be fired for being polite to a homeless couple. A few years ago, around midnight, I had a guest come up to the front desk. A woman and a girl who was around four. The woman told me there were a couple of people sleeping in the back staircase. I told her I would take care of it and I apologized if she was inconvenienced and she went back to her room, or so I thought. I went to the back staircase and there on the second floor was an older homeless couple either sleeping or napping. So despite feeling bad, I woke them up and told them that they couldn't sleep here and they would have to leave. They apologized and thanked me for not yelling at them about it and they went on their way. I thought the issue was dealt with and went back to my duties. The rest of this I heard secondhand from my morning coworker. Apparently, the woman that told me of the homeless couple was at the top of the stairs listening and watching, and in the morning she came downstairs to complain about me. She didn't approve of the way I handled the homeless people. I told my morning coworker about what had happened so he'd know I wasn't mean or nasty or anything. So what was I supposed to do? Grab them by the ears and throw them out of the back door? Either way, she wasn't happy with the way I handled the situation, despite not giving an answer of what I should have done. And then she started adding other details onto it. She said they smelled like meds. Didn't say which ones. When I spoke to them, I didn't smell anything. She said she didn't like the way the man stared at them. If they were sleeping, how could he even have looked at them in the first place? And if you felt unsafe, why did you go near him? And then she started adding other things, not part of the homeless people. She said it was too loud by her room and she couldn't get to sleep. So coworker asked her why she didn't report it to the front desk. She didn't have an answer. No matter what my coworker said, she kept ranting and raving and demanding not only a full refund, but a free night stay and for me to be fired. Of course, none of that happened. And due to her attitude and the language she used, she was told to leave and she was put on a do not rent list. The kicker is, even after all of this, she still came back the next day and tried to rent another room. And she threw another fit when she was told that she was no longer welcome. Am I the jerk for leaving my family in squalor and going to a resort? So let's begin with this. I make decent money, but I'm in no way rich. I like to take my family on vacation and have been stimmied for the last couple of years. So this summer, I decided to do something I thought was pretty great. I paid for my family to go to Disneyland. Not just my wife and kids, but also my father-in-law, mother-in-law, my wife's brother and his wife and kids, so 10 people. I also rented a McMansion with a pool and everything. I bought all the groceries and rented a truck so I could ferry the luggage and in case of emergency, we would have a vehicle. My kids are in their teens and my nephews are a few years younger. My immediate family did not require any help with the kids and realistically, neither did my in-laws. So we get to the house and the problems start. The room I had picked out for my wife and I is obviously the nicest. My father-in-law and mother-in-law chose to stay in the pool house. This left five other bedrooms for six people. Brother-in-law and sister-in-law, my two kids, their two kids. Simple, right? Not so fast. 
Why did I get the best room? They hadn't had some nice time alone in years. Why did my kid get to pick the room with the ensuite? Why did one room have a bigger TV? Why are we having to cook some meals? Why don't we just order every meal? Goodness. I just went to my room and I went to sleep. First day, more BS. Why do we have to wait in lines? Why don't we get the tour guide that lets us skip the lines? My wife started joining in. She said we shouldn't be cooking at the house and that it wasn't fair to her and sister-in-law to be stuck with the cleaning. My kids always help. I do too. Brother-in-law doesn't lift a finger to help though. My in-laws joined the fun at the end of the day. They didn't want to wait for the Uber. Could they take the truck and meet us back at the house? My wife said to let them. I got sick of it. I ordered everyone pizza, and then while they were gorging themselves, I called an Uber and went to stay at a hotel that I'm a super shiny member of. I used my points to book a suite for the next six days. I texted my wife and I told her I would catch up with everyone in the morning at the park. She's mad that I left her to deal with those ungrateful greedy people. I'm sitting in the pool enjoying a gin and tonic and writing this because I left the park after I saw the new superhero stuff at the park. Her brother and sister-in-law are now bugging her to give up the nice room since she's alone. Now she's not on their side. Too late. So, am I the jerk for leaving them to all sort out their own stuff after I went out of my way to do something nice and they crapped all over it? Edit. I'm going to get ready for the game. Thank you guys. You've given me a lot to think about. Yikes, edit. My wife went beast mode. She's spending the night with me at the hotel after the game. I'm back at the house tomorrow. My brother-in-law has been told if he looks at our room, he and his wife are going to a motel. In-laws were told to Uber wherever they wanted. We're still taking everyone out for one dinner, but all other meals not made in the house are paid for your own way. And brother-in-law is responsible for cleaning up after meals. Honestly, didn't think she had that in her. Not the jerk. This is actually hilarious. You took a vacation from your entitled relative's vacation. Well, maybe you should have warned your wife and brought her along and left the other relatives to figure things out for themselves. I can't even fathom someone sponsoring me for a free vacation like that and saying anything but, thank you so much. Let me get your suitcase for you. This is fantastic. Next year, tell them since the last vacation wasn't up to their standards, you're going to let them pay for this one and show you how it's done properly. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the in-laws? Please let us know. In-laws are to be avoided at all costs, especially when it comes to vacations. Karen threatens to burn my house down. Long story short, I was best friends with Sarah from age 13 to 18. We're now in our mid-30s. We stayed in touch after high school, talked occasionally, and even hung out a few times. To my knowledge, there was never any animosity. Anyway, my dad and Sarah's mom work together and are acquaintances. And when my dad bumped into Sarah's mom at the grocery store a few weeks ago, she mentioned she was selling her home soon, the house that Sarah had grown up in. It is the size we need and the district we need. My dad told Sarah's mom we may be interested in taking a look at it before it went on the market, so we arranged a date and a time. I excitedly texted Sarah to tell her that we were seeing her mom tomorrow to look at the house and received replies such as, You're not going to get the house so you and your dad can buzz off. That's so inappropriate, so drop it. It'll never happen. I'll burn it down before that happens. That's so inappropriate to try and buy my childhood home without even talking to me. So, I ask, am I the jerk for not consulting my childhood friend about potentially buying her former home? Note, neither her nor her brother are interested in buying it as they have their own homes. Update, her mom called off our meeting to see the house. I'm assuming due to Sarah completely losing her crap, as she stated in other texts, she was gonna go flip out on her mom. Sarah has struggled with mental health in the past and has actually spent some time in a mental health institution. Due to the unhinged texts and open threats, it's probably for the best her mom called off the meeting and that we don't go through with purchasing, as we have three kids and we don't want to be constantly looking over our shoulder. I'm sure something else will come along, so I'm not upset about the house at this point but I will say the friendship is definitely over. Not the jerk. She needs to get over herself. Her parents own the house and they decide if you can buy it or not. Show them the text their daughter sent you. Not the jerk. And I feel like Sarah is upset the house is being sold because she wanted to inherit it. Not the jerk. And Sarah seems extremely unhinged over this. She gets no say in who her mother chooses to sell her home to. Are you paying a fair market price? If so, I would tell Sarah's mom that Sarah seemed upset about you buying the house. This may be an issue between the two of them more than you.
Am I the jerk for embarrassing my neighbor? I'm 29, female. My husband, who's 31, and I moved into a nice flat near the city center. We're in England. It's a rather nice area. Our next door neighbor has her balcony next to ours. My husband is half Spanish, half Polish. I'm Polish. We speak both languages and often speak in a weird combination of both, sometimes adding English into the mix. Anyway, both languages are spoken rather fast, or they seem so, and can sound a bit aggressive if you're not used to them. I've had people assume I was angry because of how the language sounded to them when I was having a completely pleasant conversation. My neighbor was no exception. She's heard us talking and must have assumed that we were arguing. We weren't. She approached me and asked me, concerned, if I was okay. I was confused and she explained that she'd heard our arguments. I explained that I was fine and we hadn't been arguing at all. I suggested that it might be because of how harsh both languages can sound. She didn't believe me and told me she was there if I needed help. I told my husband and we laughed and decided to speak a bit more quietly just in case. One day we were chatting and joking around when two police officers knocked on our door. Someone called with concerns about my well-being. What? We explained our situation, they took me aside and I had to explain everything. It was humiliating, even more so for my poor husband. The next day, my neighbor approached me again and I repeated that we weren't arguing and she had to let it go. She told me that she wouldn't have to worry if we just switched to English. I told her we wouldn't be doing that and she'd have to take my word for it and to stop bothering us. Last night, she posted a recording to our neighborhood's group. It was of me having a good time with my husband, joking around. She said she believed I was in danger and asked what to do and who to report it to because I was in denial. People were agreeing with her calling me names and told her to keep recording because I was covering for him and complaining how difficult it was to help foreigners when they don't speak English. They called me all sorts of names for covering for my husband and I was just confused. It wasn't until someone who spoke Spanish chimed in and said that we weren't arguing. Someone else who spoke Polish said the same thing and told her to mind her own business instead of recording people. She removed the recording. Today, she knocked on my door shouting at me, telling me I humiliated her and I must have done it on purpose to toy with her when she was just concerned. I told her I explained it to her many times, but she wouldn't listen. She just kept shouting and calling me names, and I just shut the door in her face. My neighbor is still furious with me, and I'm confused, and I do feel bad because I understand where she was coming from, and she did have good intentions. Should I have switched to English to avoid this whole situation? It would have been an easy fix. Am I the jerk for confusing her? Edit, I just wanted to clarify. We really weren't loud. Our walls are thin. I can easily hear her talking in her flat and she talks normally if she's in the adjacent room. She recorded it from the balcony. We had our balcony door open and we're chatting inside. She video recorded from her balcony when she was outside. Our balconies are very close. Not the jerk. Honestly, I'd report her for harassment. And recording you without your knowledge and posting the private conversation to social media? That's a serious invasion of your privacy. You shouldn't have to switch to her language just because she can't stay out of other people's business. Am I the jerk for refusing to answer my girlfriend's question? I, 26 male, have known my best friend, 26 male, since we were 14. We live in two different states now, so I don't get to see him nearly as often as I would like to, but we do keep in touch through near daily FaceTimes and pretty constant texts. Because of the distance, my fiance, 27 female, hasn't gotten many chances to meet him in person. We did FaceTime introductions and they've said brief hellos at a couple weddings we all attended, but they haven't been around each other in many non-formal circumstances. Anytime I see him otherwise, I usually go down to his place for the weekend by myself. He had a pretty rough time in his late teens and early 20s. He was struggling with addiction issues, among other things, to cope with bad life circumstances. He distanced himself from everyone, excluding myself and a handful of others. My family really rallied around him during this time to support him, even from afar, so I'd say all of us are pretty protective of him. They just have to be quiet about it since he isn't interested in anyone other than that aforementioned handful of people seeing him vulnerable. Luckily, he's doing much better now. Last night, my parents hosted a little get-together for my mom's birthday and he was invited. They live at a decent halfway point between us both, so it works perfectly. It was the first time my fiancé and him were around each other for more than a few hours in a more casual setting. It became obvious quickly that they don't get along. It also became obvious that because their previous interactions had all included long sleeves, my fiancé had never seen my friend's bare arms, 
which have scars on them. I caught her looking a few times over the course of the night, but I didn't say anything. I'm pretty protective over him, but I knew he could handle it himself if he was too bothered. Towards the end of the night, he did end up making a, my eyes are up here, sort of joking comment. Even my parents pulled me aside at one point to mention it, and it soured their view of her a little. When we got in my car on the way back, she almost immediately asked me what had happened. After being frustrated over her behavior at the party, I told her not to play stupid. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's up. She told me I was being a jerk and that she just wanted more information, and I said it was incredibly rude to ask things like that, even indirectly. It was a brutal drive home, and I'm rethinking a few things now. Am I the jerk? Edit. For those asking why I don't warn in advance, I've introduced him to people in the past and have never had a reaction like this. He's a human being. I don't exactly think he needs a warning label. You're the jerk. It might have been rude for her to openly ask him, but she didn't. She asked you in private. And if the scars are from this, that she may not have any frame of reference for what those scars look like. I mean, I don't have anybody in my life that struggled with this, so she may just have not realized. You're the jerk. She had no idea what she was walking into. You should have told her beforehand. At the point that you've asked someone to marry you, you should be able to trust them with the story of your best friend, at least enough of it so she isn't blindsided in a social situation. You're the jerk. While I hate to say it, you should have been more sensitive here. Your fiancé may not have been playing stupid and could have been genuinely unsure. Not everyone has seen this sort of thing before and it may have been confusing for her. I understand that you're protective of your friend and really sensitive to anything that may appear as an attack on him, but you have to give your fiancé the benefit of the doubt here. You probably should have said that her actions may have been interpreted as disrespectful. Unless you truly believe she was being rude on purpose, your actions were a little more brash than they should have been. Am I the jerk for disrespecting a family recipe? Background I, 24 female, moved out of home for school at 18 and have been living abroad on my own ever since, cooking my own food. I don't believe I'm a picky eater, but I do avoid certain foods. Most meat, mayo, vinegar. If I'm invited somewhere and I don't like the food or some of the ingredients, I'll smile and eat anyways, but I avoid these foods if I can choose. My mother knows about it, so when she cooks, she usually will set aside a small portion for me before adding mayo or vinegar. One of the side dishes of yesterday's meal was a potato salad typical of my region. Basically, potato puree with small pieces of veggies and seafood mixed in with mayo. Mayo is a key element of this recipe, which is why I never order that dish, but my mother usually sets aside a portion before adding the mayo. Usually she will set aside a big portion so that other people feel welcome to eat the alternative. No mayo version if they want. Dinners here are always potluck style. But this time she forgot and I arrived at the kitchen on time to set aside a small part that had no mayo yet. Not more than three or four spoons. So when we served dinner, I just took the plate for myself. We have eaten with everyone invited yesterday countless times and I can't remember any times where any of them ate the no mayo version. I ate the same main as everyone else. One of the family friends noticed my plate was different. She asked me if I didn't think the potato salad was great. I agreed. Then why did my plate look different and why hadn't I been served from the same dish as the others? I told her mine had no mayo. Did I have any intolerance? No ma'am, I just don't like mayo. But potato salad without mayo is just potato puree. Maybe ma'am, but I enjoy potato puree. At this time, she started insisting I try the real recipe and see how good it is. I told her I grew up with it. I knew it was good and I was happy everyone enjoyed it. I just preferred my version. I admit I was a bit short. I didn't see my meal choice warranted so much attention. My family hates conflict and was trying to steer the conversation somewhere else, but this person went on a rant about how young people are entitled and unappreciative of their traditions. I looked her dead in the eye and said I did not think I was the entitled one here since I had not gone to her own home to tell her how to eat her own food. Complete silence. She was visibly annoyed, but let my mother change the topic. I believe I was in my right to tell her that she was out of line, but my poor grandpa looked dismayed at the tension, and it probably would have been easier if I had taken a small portion with mayo and politely agreed. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. It's one thing to ask a question about why you had a different side dish out of curiosity, but she doubled down and was trying to go off on you for it. In your own house. That will always make her the jerk. 
Am I the jerk for breaking a promise and attending my stepdaughter's graduation? I'll start by explaining some backstory. I, 54 male, lost my first wife when my son, 25 male, and daughter, 22 female, were ages 9 and 12. Both my kids took it as hard as you would expect and to this day have a poor relationship with both my current wife, Doreen, who's 49, and my stepdaughter, Amy, who's 18. I started dating Doreen about four months after my wife passed. As such, my kids believe I cheated on their mom. Amy was five when we got together, and as such, I see her as my own daughter. On to the actual story. Four years ago, two days before Kay's high school graduation, Amy got very ill while visiting her grandparents and ended up needing emergency surgery. My wife and I rushed to be with Amy, and admittedly, I did not communicate well with Kay. At the time, Kay didn't pick up my calls, so I left her a voicemail and several text messages explaining what happened and telling Kay I was sorry, but I would make it up to her. A few hours go by and I get a call from Kay. She's in hysterics, telling me what a terrible father I am and stated that if I did not attend her graduation, I would be done to her. I chose to support Amy. True to her words, Kay did not contact me on the day of her graduation. And when I came home, Kay's things had been moved out of the house with a note explaining how we were no longer family and to never contact her again. Luckily, Kay and I were able to reconcile. However, I promised her that I would give her absolutely anything in the world to make her forgive me. She said that she would forgive me as long as I refused to attend Amy's graduation as this was the only way to make it fair. I agreed at the time, thinking she was just joking or angry and would soon forget about it. This leads me to now. Invitations for Amy's graduation went out, and despite all the hostility, Amy wanted to make sure Kay got one. Kay called Amy later that day and said she would be unable to attend, as she and I would be spending the day together per our agreement. Amy broke down into tears, asking me why I was missing her graduation. I assured her I was not, and that I would speak to Kay. Later, I explained to Kay that I simply could not miss Amy's graduation. Kay launched into a tirade about how I was a liar and a jerk, and how could I do this to her again? I told her that we would talk about it when she calmed down, and she said we would never talk again. My son and our extended family have all taken Kay's side, saying I didn't see how hurt she was at graduation. My wife believes I'm the jerk for even promising that in the first place, as I should have known it would only upset one or both of the girls. And Amy is just sad and confused, wondering why Kay can't stand her. I know keeping my promise and not attending Amy's graduation is probably the only way to salvage my relationship with Kay, but no matter how I look at it, I would feel like I'm punishing Amy for having a medical issue. So, am I the jerk? You're the jerk, and you have been for years. You are a bad father. Kay is correct. You're a liar. You've done nothing to prioritize Kay ever since your new family rolled in. Your relationship with your daughter is done for, and the blood is on your hands. You're the jerk. You replaced your kid's mom with a new family four months after she passed. Your kids lost their mom so young, and you don't seem like you prioritized their feelings or helped them deal with things. Instead, you moved on fast. Kay didn't have a mother to attend her graduation, and she needed you there. Could you not have driven to the graduation, then back to the hospital? Yeah, you're the jerk and you know it. You're clutching at straws here in the hopes that someone will validate your poor parenting choices. She moved out all those years ago. You're already on your second chance. You provide Amy with two parents all the time and you choose to leave Kay with no parents. Every time you choose Amy over Kay, you orphan her. The only way you get to keep three kids is to skip Amy's graduation as you promised and you should have told Amy about this long, long ago. However, you being the poor excuse for a parent that you seem to be, you thought that you'd just blank this promise to the kid whose graduation you skipped. If you break it, you lose Kay, and you'll likely lose your son too. You're the jerk. Edit. And let's not even bother going down the new woman while your kids are still grieving the loss of their mother route. Four months? Bruh, y'all be wildin' out today. What is wrong with y'all? Am I the jerk for refusing to help my sister with her rent, which will cause her to be evicted and my niece to transfer to a bad school district? My sister Jessica is irresponsible with money. She tries to live beyond her means and expects someone else to bail her out. This behavior has not changed since having my niece, Valentina, Tina, and Jessica has in fact been even less responsible with her spending. Jessica has been behind on her rent for months. She's treated it like a joke, 
constantly going to the mall, and even taking Tina on an expensive spring break vacation. Jessica's landlord told her that she had one last chance to pay back her rent within the next two weeks, or else he would be forced to evict her. Some background on my family is that they all live in a very large house. Two stories, seven bedrooms, and a large yard. Family members built it generations ago, so my family pays practically nothing in taxes, but they are not at all well off. Their collective income is so low that they qualify and rely on services such as the food bank. For this reason, they're unable to help Jessica pay back her rent. My family is hoping that I will help because if Jessica and Tina move into my family's house, Tina would be forced to transfer to a bad school district. Tina's current school will allow her to finish the year, but after, she's expected to transfer and begin sixth grade at a different school district. Jessica is begging me to help with her rent because she doesn't want Tina to have to leave all her friends behind. She's also very worried because the school district within our family's address is known for being a bad one. This district has had many issues since we attended as students. The amount Jessica needs would be a lot for me. It would still be possible for me to give it, but I refused. I told Jessica that this is on her. She chose to live beyond her means and treat her rent issues like a joke. I'm not responsible for her choices. She chose to have a kid. My love for Tina does not make her my responsibility. It will be hard for Tina, but sixth grade is still easier to adapt to a new school and friend groups constantly change during that age anyway. I also reminded Jessica that despite the issues at this school district, we didn't get involved in any of those bad activities because we were taught not to give in to peer pressure. Tina is a smart girl and I'm sure she'll be fine. My family has told me that they are disappointed in Jessica but are disappointed in me as well. And they said that Jessica is irresponsible but that they hoped I would put my niece well-being first. I still feel that this situation is entirely of Jessica's making and she has sole responsibility for it. Besides, it's not as if Jessica or Tina will be homeless. They'll be able to stay at the family house. Tina will still have access to an education, even if it's not as good as the one offered by her previous school district. Am I the jerk for refusing to help with Jessica's rent? Not the jerk. Your sister had money. She just spent it. And the bad outcome here is not so bad. She'll still have housing and a functional, if not preferred, school. It's a hard lesson, but she needs to learn it. Not the jerk. If you help Jessica right now, she'll be back in the same spot in six months. Instead, you're helping her by forcing her to live with non-catastrophic consequences of her actions, and hopefully she changes her behavior. Neighbors demand my parking space so their kids can play in it. I, 27 female, am currently single. I purchased a nice big apartment in a quiet neighborhood a few years ago, and along with it, I also got three parking spaces, each for about $25,000. This is a lot of money, but at the time, I figured parking was crap and it was about to get worse in terms of availability. That turned out to be true. I have two cars and my ex used to have one, so we used all three spaces. Recently, we broke up and I started traveling a lot. I let my baby cousin use one of the cars, so I had two free parking spots. I offered them to my only neighbor, which I like. She's engaged but has no kids. I rented them both to her for $100, even though realistically rent should be $700 to $800. I checked prices and they're going crazy. One space rents for $300 to $400. The rest of our neighbors were not a favorite choice of mine because honestly, they suck. One of my parking spaces is kind of small and I have a big BMW which I parked in that spot one night. The next day, they had parked in such a way that I was unable to move without crashing into someone. When I asked them to move their cars and promised to just switch around parking spots so issues don't repeat, I got the answer. You are smart enough to leave your car there. You should be smart enough to get it out. Don't you have a million cars? Go drive somewhere else. I got them towed and they screamed at me, so that was fun. Suffice to say, we are not friends with the four families involved in this fiasco, which is why my lovely neighbor, Skye, that even defended me, got my parking spots. People noticed Skye's cars, and only a few days later, they made a building association meeting, something I haven't been invited to in a year, and sat me down and let me know that the parking situation is unfair. They said I have to put the parking spots up for the whole building and have a rent auction for who will pay the most. They said they feel I was being unfair as they had kids and Sky doesn't. I felt bad and talked it over with Sky. She agreed her and her fiance can manage with one of the bigger spaces, which barely fits two cars, the second blocking the first. 
Well, they weren't happy. Apparently, they all wanted this big parking space because it is in the shade and they can put slides and other contraptions for their kids to play in. I let them know this makes me uncomfortable as I will be back at some point and I do not want anyone to invest in anything. They called me selfish and a jerk. I got upset and told one of the moms who was on my case that kids are a choice and that does not make her special. She kept saying, no wonder you are single, no wonder you don't have kids. She called me a rich spoiled brat. No one except Sky speaks with me anymore. Should I just give them the parking spot they want? Am I the jerk? No way. You shouldn't even give them a chance to rent any of your spaces. They can't choose who you rent to. You own it, you get to decide. For all they know, you're not renting it. You just told your neighbor they could park there. Forget them. If they come at you with some BS, tell them to call your lawyer. OP. I'm trying to figure something out because at the end of the day, I gotta look at them every day and watch them sneer and scowl. I know parking spaces are mine and ultimately the decision is up to me. I may be second guessing the fairness of it all and how I acted. I have told them off and have refused to talk about it anymore. I guess I just want a more grown up solution. I don't even understand why they're fighting so hard for two spaces which I will most likely reclaim in a month when I get homesick. Not the jerk. Do not listen to them. Get a lawyer. Have all communications regarding the spaces referred to your lawyer. Get business cards from him to hand out. Don't listen to people who don't care about you. Also, get cameras for your residence and enjoy your life. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay for my stepson's tuition? Some quick background knowledge. My mom passed when I was 8 years old and upon her passing, my dad and I discovered she was much wealthier than we thought. She set up an education fund with enough money to put me through college and grad school and attend a private school. I attended a private school I had a partial scholarship to and then went to college on a full scholarship I worked insanely hard for. I went to grad school on no scholarship so I dipped into a bit of the education money. However, after all of this, I still had quite a bit of money left over so I planned to use it for any kids I had in the future. And now the present. My biological daughter, Anna, who's 17, female, has attended a private high school and recently got into a good college on a partial scholarship. She wants to go to medical school. Between the three of those, if she can get a partial scholarship to medical school, I would be able to help her out significantly, so she would be in very little debt. I realized how insanely privileged we are to have this opportunity, and both my daughter and I are super happy to have it. I have a stepson, Jake, who's 18, who is also going to college this fall. He didn't go to the same high school as Anna because he didn't get in, so he went to the local public high school. He's still an excellent athlete and student, and that landed him a partial scholarship at his top choice college. Obviously, I was super elated and super proud of both my kids. Here's where the issue comes in. My husband and I, who have been married for three years now, came up with a plan for parenting slash financing and all that stuff. We plan to keep most of the money separate when it comes to kids. Obviously, we'd both contribute to buying them presents and stuff, but we left cars, college, etc. up to the other one, and it's worked out pretty well. Both Anna and Jake have cars that they paid half for, and we matched whatever they saved. I matched for Anna, and my husband matched for Jake. So for college, it was obviously decided my husband had Jake's stuff under control, and I'd be dealing with Anna's. However, my husband finds it very unfair that Anna will be in no debt and Jake will be in debt, since I'm covering Anna's college costs, but not Jake's. My husband says it's unfair that Anna will have an easier life than Jake, and called both of us spoiled and entitled kids for not sharing the money. My mother-in-law also dropped by yesterday and told me I was being unfair and I should help Jake out, and that I clearly loved him less. I explained to both of them that this was the agreement my husband agreed to, and he only has a problem because Anna will end up doing better now. Mother-in-law and husband are both giving me and Anna the silent treatment. Am I the jerk? Edit. Jake's mother is out of the picture. She left years ago and neither Jake nor my husband are in contact with her or know where she is, as far as I'm aware at least. Anna's father passed soon after she was born. Not the jerk. Each agreed to take care of your own kids. How is it suddenly unfair? Your hubby is the jerk. And if Granny wants to join in, tell her to crack open her purse and chip in since she's so insulted. OP, what a great suggestion. Definitely using that against my mother-in-law. You've only been married for three years. That money long predates him. You should ask him if he enjoyed growing up with a mother, then tell mother-in-law if she's so concerned about her kids' and grandkids' education, 
maybe she can go off and pass like your mother did. They need a reality check of how privileged they are and that this money didn't just manifest itself out of nowhere. You suffered a major loss and this is what's left. Your daughter will always be your daughter, but if things don't work out for you or your hubby, statistically speaking, Jake will no longer be your stepson and you will never see the money again and your daughter will be further in debt because of it. It might not sound like it, but I'm very sorry for the loss of your mother. Not the jerk. The two of you had an agreement which he had no problem with until now. What does Jake think about this situation? It sounds like your husband is just unhappy that his biological son isn't doing as well as your biological daughter. OP I think Jake wishes he had the money, but he's not blowing it out of proportion and is currently asking his grandmother and dad to drop it. He's being very nice to both Anna and I. It's his father who's dragging this out. Don't want me to work during my notice? Okay, I won't. This happened almost five years ago. Some details are intentionally vague. I was working in an organization that was super toxic, so much so that we were a revolving door. Most employees stayed only a few months. To counter this, our management put three months notice into everyone's contract, including existing employees. It's not strictly illegal where this happened, but very unusual. I believe the idea was to make it harder for employees to find a job outside, as employers didn't usually want to wait for three months. However, this didn't work as people simply quit and waited for a month or two before starting their job hunt. I was there almost four years. I needed the money, so I put up with whatever crap was thrown at me. My boss was a guy we'll call Vince, not his actual name. Now Vince was not particularly good, but he sometimes respected the fact that I was the most tenured grunt in the organization. Do note that after about two years, I was doing a lot of additional work in addition to my official responsibilities, primarily because I was the only one who knew how to do those. Everyone else had already left. This will become important later. Enter Rajesh, not actual name. Rajesh was poached from a somewhat infamous company and was literally flown in from a different continent. He was brought in for strategically improving our division. This was quite strange given our division generated most profits. Within months, Rajesh made the environment even more toxic. He pulled Vince's team under him and got Vince fired, and he actively encouraged us grunts to spy on each other. Rajesh also had it out for me from day one. Till today, I don't know why. He started making my life more hard than others. This culminated in him taking me aside and telling me that I was not pulling my weight. Now at this point, I was doing quite well in the organization, and I had been doing a lot of additional work critical to our business since only I knew certain systems and processes. So I was quite angry. I started looking out. I still wasn't brave enough to quit and start looking. Fortunately, I was able to find a job that was willing to wait the three months. So it was my turn to take Rajesh aside and tell him that I quit. Boy, Rajesh was angry. He went from denial, you can't quit, to negotiation, what if I give you a raise at the end of the year, to acceptance. Thus, I was serving my notice and working away like an honest bee, my usual work plus the additional work. At this point, I was called by HR and told that Rajesh wanted me gone. The insane part was that they wanted me to pay the company for the two and a half month shortfall in notice. I obviously refused, then went back and checked the contract. Turns out a notice of less than three months could only happen through mutual consent and the initiating party, company if they wanted me gone sooner, or me if I wanted to leave earlier, had to compensate the other party for the shortfall. The next day I stopped doing almost all of my work. I logged in and logged out my hours and did nothing. I stopped doing any additional work I had been doing and started taking it really slow on my primary job responsibilities. Since no one else understood the details of what I did, I knew it would be really hard for Rajesh or HR to prove I was doing any of this on purpose. Then I sat back with my popcorn. Soon there was a complete meltdown all around. Rajesh would pull me into meetings and scream and try to bully me and I would say nothing but smirk to his face. Then they tried to have someone else learn the additional work I used to do for me so that they could do what I did. Remember I said earlier how I was the only one who knew some of the old systems and processes? Well, now I claimed I didn't really remember any of them, so obviously there could be no handover. Rajesh could do nothing as none of this had been my responsibility or part of my contract, since the leadership had been only too happy to see me do this for free. Soon, my workplace turned into a dumpster fire. The HR and Rajesh smartened up and offered to buy out my notice if I cooperated and helped transition my work. I refused. 
Then, to twist it further, I started having meetings with fellow grunts. Remember, everyone was always a newbie, and encouraged them to leave as well. Indirectly, nothing that could implicate me. HR tried to get me to leave twice more, but I ended up serving the full three months. My wife keeps demanding I take pictures of her. My wife and I have been married for one year, and we've been together for about seven. An argument that recurs frequently, especially when we're on vacation, centers around her desire to take multiple photos and my absolute disdain for being the person who has to take all of them. Here's how it typically plays out. We visit a new place. She immediately asks me to take her picture. I oblige, but then she goes off on me if the picture is ugly or if she thinks I made little attempt to take a good picture. So then I have to take another one. She reviews and the process repeats until she's satisfied. Personally, I've never been big on taking photos while on vacation and I have not traveled a lot internationally. I like to be in the moment, take in the whole sight and get lost in my thoughts. However, I feel like I have to interrupt this experience multiple times to take her pictures or get into a selfie with her. Then I lose out on the experience because all of a sudden a photo takes precedence. In the past, I've snapped a quick picture with little effort to get back to what I was there to do, experience something new. After getting called out multiple times for my low effort, I now attempt to take a good picture or at least listen to her instructions so that I can get the picture to her liking. But recently, she's called my pictures ugly even when I've made an attempt to take good photos. This results in me taking dozens of pictures in the same place of the same person with the same backdrop until she's satisfied or until I lose patience and tell her that I'm done. Moreover, she's even gotten upset with me for posting a picture of her to social media that she didn't like, even though I actually thought the picture looked good. My wife is naturally gorgeous physically, but I don't need a good picture to show that. I'd like to consider myself a creative, and sometimes I just like a good candid picture of her eating an ice cream or fixing her glasses. But if I unwittingly share said photo on social media, a whole argument ensues. I think the whole situation is stupid. In my opinion, photographs are an afterthought, a tool, not the main objective. I want to see new things and experience new people. I have little desire to take pictures beyond what I need to remember the moment or to capture something aesthetically pleasing. I know it's reasonable to want pictures of yourself, but at some point, the whole exercise becomes excessive. In my opinion, that point is when the pictures begin to distract from the whole purpose we're there, to see and experience something new. My wife and I are currently in Italy, sitting silently in a hotel room because I objected to her 20th something selfie in front of the Colosseum. It's raining and I wanted to move to the next site. We had already taken many photos together in front of the Colosseum. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. She's telling you this is important to her and you're saying, okay, well, I think it's stupid. I'm a visual person. I've taken more than 30,000 photos on trips. I sketch, I paint, I make photo books after my trips. They're special for me. There's literally a meme of a boyfriend being in an awkward angle just to get a really great photo of his girlfriend because he supports her. You can easily compromise here. Set a time limit. I'll take as many photos of you as you want for five minutes, then we move on. But nope, you've decided it's stupid and unimportant and are likely actively damaging your relationship with your wife. For what? Well, it's settled. If there's an actual meme of something, we need to be willing to put up with it. And that right, Reddit boy? The only thing I plan to put up with is the divorce attorney. How dare you? Stop bothering us with that deadline. Okay then, if you insist. Some background. I, 27 female, work in IT. I'm a well-respected and known member of the IT party circle, where I live, so to speak. I'm not jaw-dropping, but people know me and I have a very good reputation. One of the things is that I got to the point in my career when I wanted to give back, so I started mentoring others. Mostly I mentored adults and those who were closer to me in age. Career advice, how to apply for different exchange programs that can boost their professional growth and improve their speaking and writing skills, the usual. But I always loved a good challenge and decided to try and mentor kids. It's not a secret that IT and STEM are increasingly popular right now and more and more people want to get into the field. Therefore, there are myriads of boot camps, hackathons, and mentoring programs for all ages. So I signed up for one such program as a mentor. Teach kids how to code with blocks, tell them what AI is, and how to develop an MVP. It sounds more complicated than it might look at first glance, especially when you're an educated professional with a degree explaining concepts that are rather complicated to kids 
who may have less than one fiftieth of your tech knowledge. I must add that participation in the said program gives kids credits and can help them get into better schools or even be eligible for some university scholarships later in life. So only pros if you ask me. The only thing is that they must upload their MVP project to the site before the deadline. I was assigned two teams, primary, early middle schoolers, team A, and high schoolers, team B. Both had five members and the youngest and team A was eight years old. I thought, OMG, that will be tough. Thinking about team A and how I'm up for a tough time. Also, since they're so young, the parents must observe team A meetings and my lessons and parents equal problems. Ironically, despite my worries, even with help from the parents, the kids in Team A were doing great. But the same can't be said about Team B. A little side note, with my mentees, I have two rules. One, at least one meeting per week, at least 50% of the group must be present. Two, communication. When I type something like tasks to do or reply to a question asked before, I ask my mentees to respond. Not even text, a thumbs up emoji will also suffice. We all know that red status doesn't mean much when you can accidentally open an app for a second and swipe it to clear RAM on the phone. So Team A attended all the meetings and responded to my assignments. There was a curriculum provided by a program to follow, and they were very well receptive overall. Team B started out okay, but then started not showing up on meetings and leaving assignments on red, but unresponded. I understand that they have a lot on their plate. Exams are no joke but they disregarded my time, which I will not be okay with. I have a job to do, and mentoring in that program was 100% volunteering, and there was no payment for the mentors. There was, however, a very strict deadline, the middle of April, when their MVPs must be loaded onto the website for later judgment. I, even when upset, am a professional first and an angry lady second. So, I wrote multiple messages asking for updates on the project, with warnings at the end that, Deadline is April 15th. Don't miss it. After one such message, the so-called leader of Team B, Sam, wrote to me this. Um, hi OP. I know that you probably mean well, but you only bother the team with those deadline messages. Can't you like, chill out? When we need you, we will contact you and all. Just get off our hair and let us do our job. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. It is what it is. Heart. After I read that message, I was like, what? but I did respond that I would stop messaging if that caused tension between the team. Though the deadline is still on the 15th and the site would reject any application that was uploaded after. Just stop, okay? Jeez, weird little face emoji thing, said Sam to that. So I decided, okay, I'm washing my hands from this. Cue malicious compliance. Since that message, I haven't written anything to Team B. I had scheduled no meetings, updates, or checkups about the curriculum or their understanding and definitely not a written reminder of the deadline once. Deadline came, Team A uploaded their project with no issues, and their parents even bought me a nice box of chocolates as a thank you gesture. Just like the deadline came and went, Team B started bombarding chat, asking me to help because something is wrong with the site, we can't upload our project. I entered the chat and said, yes, it will not upload. No, it is not an issue with the site, the deadline has passed. So if you try to upload, it will only show you an error message. I warned you kids. No extra credits, no nothing. The rules of that program are simple, but they are hard, no exception ones. Team B tried to blame me, saying that as a mentor, it was my job to ensure they would succeed. I reminded them that my job as a mentor is to provide support and guidance, keep track of their progress, and remind them of the deadline, which, all of the above, they, via Sam, asked me not to. And since I respected their boundaries, I did exactly what they had requested. They can sulk as much as they want. I have all our communication in writing so they don't have a leg to stand on when trying to accuse me of sabotaging them in the program. Tough luck, kids. Return the car empty? Done. Talking to my grandmother earlier today reminded me of this story from a number of years ago. I live in Sydney and used to fly up to the Gold Coast three or four times a year to check on my grandmother. The whole family was in Sydney, so someone would usually pop up once each month to help her out. Anyway, I would always rent a car from Hertz when I arrived. At the time, they offered a prepaid fuel option where you would pay an amount and not need to refuel before return. It was usually less than you would pay at the local service station, so I usually took this option. 
As I picked up the keys to this shiny new manual Toyota Corolla, the woman simply said to me, So, you have the prepaid fuel. Just bring it back empty. After a few days of relaxing by the beach, I ran a few errands for my grandmother in the morning before my 1500 flight when the fuel light comes on and the words of Hurt Staff ring in my ear. Bring it back empty. Not wanting to push it, I pulled into 7-Eleven and put two liters in and went on my way. The light didn't extinguish, but with the distance I needed to cover, I figured I'd be safe. About 1300, my grandmother is pushing me out the door, telling me to catch my flight. So I make the six kilometer trip to the airport, the whole time anxiously wondering if I'll make it with the fuel remaining. As I was coming up on the airport, I felt the engine splutter, but it was still going. Heading in, it started spluttering more, so much that I genuinely thought I'd run out mere meters from my destination. As I pulled through the boom gate for rental returns, I put my foot down and got a final burst of acceleration. The car, determined to be the little engine that could, my finish line in sight and the car is going to make it. Until it didn't. The car stalled. With the momentum I had, I pulled it into a spot marked AVIS. It only made it about halfway in. I tried in vain to restart it, but it wasn't to be. I got out and pushed the little engine that could into Bay 109. It was 11 bays short of the first marked Hertz and was a broken man. My goal so near yet so far. Torment ran through my mind. Did those 11 bays mean I was short of my goal to bring it back empty? I mean, it was in the rental car park after all, and it wasn't uncommon for people to just park in a spot and ignore who owns the spot. I walk into the terminal, carry on roller bay in one hand, car keys in the other, and walk up to the rental returns. Can I help you? The same young woman asks as I walk up to her. Returning a car, I said. She takes the paperwork and asks where I had parked it. Bay 109, it says Avis. I respond, her not looking up. She shrugs and talks into the radio on the counter. Return 109. Finally, she says, did you fill it up? I say no, and she asks roughly how much is left in it. None, I say. Oh, so the petrol light is on? No worries, she says. No, I say. I mean, it ran out of fuel as I drove in. I had to push it into the parking lot. The helpful woman gives me a blank stare for a full 10 seconds. Wait, you let it run out? You said return it empty, so I accepted your challenge. Seems I win, I said with a mixture of pride and embarrassment. The staff member turns to her colleague, points at me, and says, Prepaid fuel, and he says it ran out in the car park. The guy looks at me with a smirk and says, Really? Well, it wouldn't start back up. I reply as someone comes in from outside to get the keys. It's out of fuel, the woman says. That's okay. I'll run it up to Shell after I've washed it, he replies. Both terminal staff look at him as the woman, looking at me, says, No, the customer says he had to push it into the spot. He with the largest eyes I've ever seen. I have to see this. He walks out with me, and the guy from behind the counter following behind opens the car and tries to start it. It's cranking, but won't turn over as all three of us burst out laughing. I've never had one fully out before, he says, when I tell him, the woman in there told me to bring it back empty, as I walk inside, laughing to check my bags. My stepson is demanding my engagement ring. I, 49 female, have been with my husband Bill, 53 male, for the past 20 years. Bill had two kids from his previous marriage, Jim, who's 31, and Paige, who's 27. We also have one biological kid together, Harry, who's 16. Jim and Paige's mom passed when they were 9 and 5. I met Bill around two years after his former wife had passed. When I started building a relationship with the kids, I made it clear that I was not going to replace their mom and would be a trusted figure whom they could approach if they ever needed me. That being said, I still made an effort to treat them like I would my own kid. I would take them to school, pick them up, take them to doctor's appointments, make their lunches, ask my parents to get them presents for Christmas and birthdays, etc. Both kids were somewhat hostile towards me at first, which I understand because they had lost their mom. However, Paige eventually warmed up to me and saw me as a trusted confidant and maternal figure. She didn't ask me, nor did I expect her to want me to adopt her, but she still calls me mom, which I appreciate. Jim, on the other hand, continued to be mean and hostile. I've never treated him poorly or antagonized him. Nevertheless, he would make mean statements like, It's your job to clean these dishes when I would ask him to clean his plate or call me names when my back was turned. 
My husband told him many times that the way he was treating me was uncalled for and for us to go to family therapy, but he always refused. He eventually moved out after reaching adulthood. He continues to maintain contact with his father and siblings, but it's minimal between him and me, and even then he doesn't treat me well. Now, I have an engagement ring that's a family heirloom for several generations. It's been passed down from the mother to the oldest kid. My husband got the ring from my mom to propose to me. I told all three kids about this heirloom a few years ago. Anyway, Jim currently has a girlfriend whom he intends to propose to. He called me out of the blue one day and asked if he could have the ring. I told him no. When he asked why, I told him it was because of how he's treated me all these years and how he continues to treat me and I don't want my family heirloom going to someone who sees me as vermin. When he asked whom it would go to, I told him it would go to Paige when she gets engaged. When he heard this, he lost his crap and accused me of playing favorites. I eventually hung up when he wouldn't stop insulting me and I blocked his number. My husband is on my side, but his maternal relatives have all been blowing up my phone telling me what a jerk I am. So, am I the jerk? Wait, you're not even his biological mom? Why does he need your family heirloom if he hasn't welcomed you into his family? You're giving it to your oldest kid, I'm assuming, meaning the oldest kid that has accepted you as family, not the oldest biological. Not the jerk. He's had plenty of time to grow up and treat you like a real person. If his maternal family is so concerned, you should ask them where his mother's family's ring is. Am I the jerk for ruining my brother's relationship? I, 28 female, always had a great relationship with my brother, who's 38, and the rest of my family. When my son, who's now five, was born, they supported me through a lot especially since my baby's father abandoned us. The problem started when he met his girlfriend in her 30s in university. At the start, I was truly happy for him, especially since he had talked to me about wanting to ask her out ever since he heard about her from his classmates. What I didn't like is that she didn't care much to keep in contact with us. Even after being together for well over a year, she was always too busy to meet our family. He told me she was an amazing cook, was kind, brilliant, etc., and he always wanted to marry her and travel with her back to her country once she finished her PhD. He had always talked to us about how lucky he was to be dating her, she's a judge, and how her government was financing her. I'll admit, knowing a childless woman wasn't working and was paid more money than me, on top of having her rent and other things covered, stung a little, but it had nothing to do with my dislike of her. I wanted her to be more involved in our family, but there was always an excuse as to why she couldn't meet us for dinners, etc., She'd be studying, helping someone from abroad, which I don't really believe. What could she be doing for anyone being miles away? And on the rare occasions she was free, she either would travel to see her family, hosted friends, or wanted to be alone. I didn't buy that she didn't have any time for us because she doesn't work and was always at home, but she stopped accepting my visits and refused anything to do with me or my son as well, which slowly distanced my brother. She wouldn't even babysit when my parents were out of town and I needed her to watch him so I could work. Personally, I don't think she's as kind as my brother thought. My parents were on my side. Brother wanted to be neutral, but asked us to not stress her out even more. A few days ago, me and my parents went to her house to talk things out with them both. We were upset, but tried our best to explain why her distance and refusal to help was unacceptable since she doesn't work and has free time. I told her I wished she'd be more caring and she got increasingly angrier but said nothing. Then she turned to my brother and asked him if he agreed but he said he didn't want to take sides. She said that this was another example of why she felt so resistant to the idea of getting into a relationship that she couldn't take it anymore and felt better being alone and then broke up with him. I was shocked. None of us expected this and my brother immediately tried to backtrack but she told all of us to leave her house immediately and to not go back. Now I'm feeling guilty and my brother won't speak to us because I ruined his relationship and she's irreducible. She isn't bothering to listen to anyone in our family and I'm afraid there's no way to fix this. Am I the jerk or did she overreact? Edit. When I said I wanted her to be more involved in caring, I meant I wanted her to care enough to at least attend a few of the parties and dinners and other things we invited her to because we wanted to get to know her and develop a relationship with her, especially since she had told my brother she had no plans of returning to or visiting the US once she got the degree, since she felt uncomfortable here. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. She was a possible future sister-in-law and we'd lose her and our brother if they moved together 
and she had no relationship with us to ever want to visit. I didn't want nor expected babysitting unless I had no one else to ask in an emergency like the one I mentioned. Then I asked her because I thought that since she was on a paid leave from work, she could be flexible. But from what I read, from all of these responses, some who didn't need to be so mean by the way, it seems I was wrong to assume that. Also, by not wanting anything to do with my son, I also meant that she gray rocked me when I tried to speak to her about him or show photos. You're the jerk. Not her responsibility to watch your kids or be there for your whims or amusement. And be honest with yourself. The fact that she's childless and does have free time bothers you. You're not entitled to her time. Keep repeating that to yourself until it gets through to you. You can't use a competitor's phone. Well, folks, for those of you who don't know, I work on cell phone towers. I used to work in an extremely remote rural area for a now defunct small cell phone company. The conversations are to the best of my recollection. The area I worked was the type of area where you could drive for hours and not see anything but fields, forests, and animals. Most of the sites I had were what were referred to as island sites, meaning they don't hand off to another cell tower. And most of these sites were about 30 minutes apart on a good day. Er, well, I worked nights, but you get the drift. So it came around that a competitor had located quite a few sites near our sites. I, being of the mindset of efficiency, purchased a phone from them and with approval from my boss, kept it ready, especially during upgrades. But he was the type when anyone above him says, boo, he'd jump and ask how high. So a couple of months later, boss's boss leaves, and we get new boss's boss, who spent 250% of his life in the confines of New York City. Within his first week, he's working to switch, and sees me call in from our competitor's number. Of course he takes offense to this, and it quickly comes down that nobody may use a competitor's phone. I bring up my concerns, but, you know, they don't need to do this in New York City, so we're not going to do this. Mind you, my job is to shut down our sites and upgrade or repair them. Yes, I'm the guy you love to hate when you can't make a phone call. And so it happens a short time later. I'm at one of my most remote sites, a 45-minute drive to the next site on a good day, about four hours from home. I do my diligence, call the switch, tell them what I need them to change and shut down the site. An hour later, site's not up. I go through everything on my end. Yep, everything's good. Oh no. Now there's a couple of pay phones, but they were the competitor's phone. So I start driving. It takes me about an hour and a half to get to the next site because of a freak blizzard. Crap, that site's down too. Roll on to the next site, usually about 30 minutes, but it's snowing hard and the roads are horrible. Two and a half hours on the road after leaving the original site, I finally get service. Pull over, and in five minutes, we figured out the switch crossed a number and took down the wrong site. Switch promises to fix it, and I drive three hours back to the original site. Thirty minutes later, it's still not up. This time, it takes an hour to get to the closest site, call the switch again, and get it up. And after about thirty minutes, I verify it's up. Hooray! But I still have to drive back, clean up, and make some testing calls. Eighteen some odd hours after I left my driveway, I pull back in and submit my time, complete with the overtime. It's my Friday. I turn off my phone and hit the bed. Monday morning, I turn on my phone for our weekly call-in meeting, and I kid you not, it buzzes with new texts and voicemails for 20 straight minutes, all from boss and boss's boss. I jump on the call, and first thing I hear is boss's boss. Why did you have a nearly 9-hour outage for a 30-minute upgrade? Before I get a word in... And how dare you claim nine hours of overtime when you were clearly messing around, not doing your job? Me. Well, there were a series of issues outside of the site, and a freak snowstorm slowed my response. I hit send on emails I had already prepared before clocking out for the weekend with full rundown of events for the night, as a reply to the emails coming down from him dismissing my needs for a competitor's phone, and included his boss, vice president of the company. I don't want to hear excuses from you. Why didn't you just use a payphone and call for help? Literally everyone on the call groaned. Me. In case you don't remember, I just replied to a series of emails where you forbade me under threat of termination from using a competitor's phone. At this point, I hear VP join our call. And since payphones are owned by a competitor, I spent six hours driving around in a blizzard searching for service, instead of spending 45 minutes to an hour making a call on a competitor's phone. I never threatened to terminate anyone. Don't be stupid. You could have used a payphone. VP cuts in. 
It appears, bad boss, that you do not remember what you said, and Mr. Kerr has clearly documented his actions on the night in question. Bad boss, please call me immediately. Thank you everyone else for your time this morning. Please have a good day. This meeting is over. Bad boss was removed shortly afterwards, having a fairly rocky rest of his short employment. I now work for the company which purchased our competitor. I've moved to my home state, but I still work a rural market. It's not quite as bad. My sister doesn't want to free her live-in unpaid maid, so I got her fired. Backstory. Many of you have probably heard stories of families with strong hierarchy structure, normally with the eldest in the family having the most influence. My family is one of them, except that my parents are deadbeats, so my eldest sister, who's 31, our entitled mother, raised all five of us. She's the boss of the family. She says jump, everyone says how high. The focal point of the story is my younger sister, who's 20, we'll call her a little sister. Most of us have a handful, or at least a couple of memories with our mother before she lost her crap, except for little sister. For her, entitled mother is the only mom she ever had, and entitled mother knows how to take advantage of that. All of us noped out of our parents' house as soon as we turned 18, except for entitled mother, who waited until little sister and our brother were raised and in their mid-teens to move across the country, and soon found jobs and accommodations for all of us to move to the same state as her. Little sister begged for years to move in with her, but entitled mother always denied, saying that somebody had to take care of our father, and because she and her new husband needed privacy and space. That was until entitled mother got pregnant. She got little sister to move in with her, and she's been there for the past two and a half years, helping out. Now to the story. Entitled father's family wanted to visit for a couple of weeks, so little sister had to stay with me for that time so they could use her room. It's worth noting that entitled mother didn't ask or let me know about it. She just dropped little sister off. One day, she saw me studying for my master's degree and said something about how she always wanted to go to college, and this is how it went. Me. So, why don't you? Little sister. Oh, I talked to entitled mother about it, but she said not everyone is the college type and that I wouldn't have time to work, study, and take care of niece at the same time, and it's expensive. Me. Most people work and study at the same time, and she can put niece in a daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't be that much more expensive than what she's already paying you. Little sister. She doesn't pay me. She already gives me food and shelter, and if I need money, I just take a shift at work. And this is how I learned my sister was not only babysitting, but also cleaning the whole house for free every day. She was only working eight hours a week at her normal job because she was too busy taking care of our niece. Long story short, it took me weeks to convince her to apply to community college, and then more weeks on the actual process, but she finally got confirmation she would start in September. All of that behind Entitled Mother's back. She was planning on telling everyone the next time we all got together, which would be Independence Day. But before that could happen, Entitled Mother got everyone together at her house to announce that she was pregnant. Little sister starts crying because now she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Entitled mother gets deeply hurt and offended that she planned this behind her back. I butt in. Our other siblings butt in. It's just generally a mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you'd be so selfish. If you like OP so much, go stay with her. These were all some of the things she said. She kicked me and little sister out, who stayed with me until they made peace. Both of our siblings reached out, one to say that I should have minded my own business and the other to tell me that she was on my side but wouldn't say anything. After that, little sister moved back with her and didn't go to college, but they agreed she would get paid $6 an hour and be allowed to take more shifts at her job until the baby is born and then go to real college after the kid turns one year old. I know it's messed up, but all of them, especially my little sister, worship entitled mother like a god. I waited a year to act on my revenge making sure my sister had saved up enough money to live on her own. The Revenge First, what I did was research the legality of paying a homeless person in food and shelter. In the US, and depending on the state, it's legal as long as you do not cross the line and the person becomes an employee. For example, you can give the person a list of tasks you want done. However, you cannot say it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You also cannot request someone to be somewhere at a certain time. You can ask, but not demand on the time. It comes down to a choice of words. Also, you have to comply with rental laws. If your local laws say that you must give 30 days notice to a tenant, then you must give 30 days notice to this person as well. 
I had proof of all of the situation. Several screenshots of entitled mother admitting to not paying and not allowing little sister to move out or get a job and also admitting to kicking her out whenever she wanted. All this technicality seemed worthless since no one would sue her, but that didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that her boss knew that if she were to be sued, it would be a sure case. Entitled mother works for a civil rights attorney's office, so discovering she has a literal modern-day slave would probably get her fired. I could have just created a burner email and sent it all to her boss, but then they would explain to her why she's getting fired, and that would get me and little sister in trouble. So, what did I do? Entitled mother was always complaining about one of the bosses on her job that hated her and had tried to get her fired for ages. I went to the company site, found the woman, thankfully she was the only Ashley that worked there, found her on Instagram and Facebook. There she had a post tagging her yoga studio. Went to said yoga studio and created my membership. It took a few weeks of trial and error trying to find exactly what class Ashley belonged to, but I finally found her. Then I went to yoga class every Tuesday and Friday at 8 a.m. for months, slowly building a friendship with her. Around three months in, she asked me to follow her on Instagram, and I was already prepared for this scenario, having deleted the few pictures I had with Entitled Mother. After nine months, when our friendship was a strong baby, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I found out she worked with Entitled Mother. Before things could get awkward, I said, It's ironic that she works for civil rights, considering, you know, everything. That got Ashley's attention. I told her everything, showed every screenshot. I could practically see her eyes shining. They had their own history that is not important to the story. All you need to know is, Entitled Mother is a jerk. Ashley wants revenge as much as I do. I told her about Little Sister's situation and why Entitled Mother couldn't ever know about this. This is why being friends with Ashley was so important. If I had just sent them the proof and explained the situation, they would have probably just ignored it since this was a very legitimate reason to fire her and they wouldn't risk firing her for a minor mistake and maybe getting sued. I sent her the files with her promise that Entitled Mother wouldn't hear about this, but she needed it to convince the other owner, who was the reason why she wasn't fired yet. Two months later, Entitled Mother was fired for her minor mistakes, lateness, and general bad productivity. Small victory, sure, but I loved coming to visit her during the four months she was unemployed. She was looking so tired and miserable all the time since she had no money to pay for a babysitter and little sister is away at college, so she actually has to take care of her kids. Karen demands I babysit since she had a family emergency. I, 37 male, and my wife, who's 33, have no kids. We live in a small two-bedroom house with a second bedroom converted into a game room slash office for us. My sister, who's 32, and brother-in-law, who's 35, have two kids, nephew, who's eight, and niece, who's nine. Both are great kids. We love them and would do absolutely anything for them. We've babysat for my sister and brother-in-law before and had no issues until recently. On April 7th, Good Friday, brother-in-law got a call that his sister, who's 28, was in a bad car accident along with two of her friends. She had to be airlifted to the hospital. They weren't sure if she was even going to make it, so family members were being called in to say goodbye and support the rest of the family. This happened across the state we live in. Sister texted me around 10.40ish that night asking if I was awake then called to explain the situation. She then asked if I would babysit the kids over Easter weekend while they traveled across state to be with brother-in-law's family. I told her no, I couldn't. I work in a steel manufacturing plant, she knows this, on a rotary shift, and after Easter, on Monday, I would be starting the overnight shifts. I told her that I was going to sleep during the day on Saturday and Sunday to get accustomed to being on third shift. When she asked if my wife would be willing, I again told her no since she's going to be doing Easter stuff with her side of the family. When she asked why I couldn't just sleep in on Sunday or why couldn't my wife take the kids with her to the Easter stuff, I snapped back at her and I gave three reasons why. That one, I wanted the weekend to adjust my shift and sleeping schedules and couldn't do that in one day. Two, my wife wanted to spend Easter with her side of the family. And finally, that no is a complete sentence and that's final. She got upset, said we'll talk later and hung up. They took the kids and on the way, sister texted me that I'm a jerk for not taking what they're going through to heart, for not helping them in the time of need, that it wouldn't have hurt me or my wife to miss a day of sleep or take the kids with her. And brother-in-law is really upset with us. He prays we don't have an emergency and need him because he'll say no and he wants to sleep in. 
I haven't responded and we're currently not speaking to each other. Going to add, when sister called, my wife was asleep to get up early in the morning to do her family things. Our parents live in another state. Our other brother lives in another country. I don't know why she didn't call any of their friends when I refused. So, am I the jerk for not babysitting my sister's kids in their time of need? Not the jerk. I don't get why the kids couldn't be with their parents. If OP's wife is expected to take the kids with her, why couldn't they go with their own mother? I know it's a worrying time, but, and I know this is going to sound harsh, the kids' parents won't be involved with medical procedures, so they'll have plenty of time and the kids might even be a welcome distraction. Not the jerk. I work nights, and if I don't call off, I can't adjust my sleep schedule on short notice. No way you could have kept the kids quiet for 5-8 to eight hours, and that's assuming your wife could supervise them. You wouldn't be excused for calling out for an emergency for a non-relation. It boils down to, can you take the punishment for calling in, or would it jeopardize your employment status? If you aren't close to a write-up, then you should have called in to help out. Am I the jerk for not attending my sister's wedding because of her dress code? I, 18 female recently decided I'm not attending my sister's, who's 21 female, wedding. My sister has her dream wedding planned. She's been dreaming of her wedding all her life and has everything down to the T. She has her cake, her venue, her dress, the bridesmaids dresses, and the flower arrangements all prepared. She sat me and my sisters down to show us the dresses she wanted us to wear. They were cute, flowy pink gowns with pink lace around the neck area. We all loved them, but I had a problem. They were short-sleeved. Now, her wedding is in the summer, so short sleeves are kind of a must-have, but I have scars all down my arms and do not want them to be on show at the wedding. I pulled her aside and asked if I could get a dress with sleeves or if I could wear sleeved gloves. She said no and that she wants everyone to look the same, so I couldn't wear sleeves or have a different dress. I said I wasn't comfortable having my arms on show around such a large amount of people and that you would see them in all the pictures. She asked if I could just put makeup on my arms but I have keloid scars and makeup won't cover them at all. She then said if I wasn't going to cooperate, I just shouldn't come. She told my family I was being difficult and didn't want to obey the dress code because I wanted to be different. She sent out her invites a few weeks ago and messaged me asking why I haven't confirmed that I'm going. I said that I'm still not comfortable being in short sleeves and that I will just not attend since I don't want to ruin her perfect day by dressing differently. She complained, saying that she had already bought the dresses, and I said I'll give her the money for mine, but she didn't listen. I know I probably sound selfish, and I shouldn't let my own issues be priority over my sister's wedding, but I don't like being in short sleeves, and there's no other way to work around it. Edit. I did forget to add, I was not a bridesmaid. My sister wanted all the girls in our side of the family to wear the same dress as it's similar to hers. Not the jerk. You came up with a perfect solution with the gloves. Her not accepting it is because of some ridiculous perfectionist aesthetic that no one will even care about and it's absurd. She'd rather have things look a certain way, again, that no one will notice except for her, than to have her sister at her wedding. She's making a bad choice. I'm sorry it's hurting you. Not the jerk. Why is it that weddings make perfectly nice people turn into selfish entitled jerks? I always cringe when I hear dream wedding. It smacks of future bridezillas. Not the jerk. Dress codes are one thing, but this is a bit beyond. Who orders specific dresses and outfits and enforces the guests to wear them? That's very odd unless you were in the bridal party, but it sounds like you are not from what is shared in the post. Am I the jerk for saying it's easy to be a perfect mom when you don't have kids? I, 28 female, have a two-year-old son. My brother, Tommy, 25 male, has been dating Gianna, 22 female, for a few months now. She's a little judgmental. Not of me particularly, but in general. She babysits for other kids and constantly judges the parents. She says she had never let her kids act the way the kids do. Sometimes it makes sense and I agree. Others, she claims that her future kids will never, ever throw a tantrum. They'll accept no the first time, the only time. I've told her good luck with that when it comes to toddlers. My son is learning no and has appropriate consequences for tantrums, but he's learning. It'll happen. It's also important to note that Gia is infertile. She can't have kids without medical intervention or adoption. Saturday night, we went out for my dad's birthday dinner. I messed up and didn't prepare my toddler well enough. He got overstimulated and began melting down. I quickly took him out of the restaurant to calm him down before he could cause a scene. It took all of five minutes and we returned. He got food and everything was good. Gianna started on, 
My future kids will never act like that in a restaurant. I ignored her. The next day, myself, Tommy, our parents, my son and Gianna went to the mall for an event they were having. My son was playing in a structure and I had my eyes on him. My mom asked me a question and I turned to answer her. When I turned back, he was gone. Panic set in and myself, my parents and Tommy, along with some people nearby began helping me look. It only took a few minutes to find him and he was perfectly fine. He had seen a pretzel cart and wandered off. I was still pretty worked up, holding on to him for dear life. He had never wandered off before. My mom was reassuring me, saying it happened to her with both of us kids. Then I hear Gianna. Why weren't you watching him? I tried ignoring her. Then she said, I would have never let him wander off. I was already so worked up and upset, I just snapped. I said, it's easy being a perfect parent when you don't have kids. Come back to me when you do. Gianna got visibly upset. She then made Tommy take her home. Tommy and Gianna have both texted me telling me how insensitive that is since she can't have kids. To me, she talks about having kids all the time. So why is it different for me to say that? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You weren't referring to her inability to have biological kids. You were referring to her inability to keep her mouth shut. Not the jerk. Tell her you said those things because you truly believe that she will be a mother someday and will realize what a jerk she's been. It's 2023. We don't parent shame. Not all wheelchair users can walk. So I'm at a theme park and I'm a full-time wheelchair user who cannot walk or stand. I won't name the park. As soon as management found out, they were angry and more than rectified the situation. But the story is funny in my opinion. It happened a few years ago. So one of the rides is in a building and has an area outside the entrance for push chairs and those big strollers that some people bring to theme parks. My friend and I head to the entrance and this young employee comes to me and says, you just leave your wheelchair there. I look at him and my friend is about to say something and I catch their eye and wink. I wheel over to the area and sit there with my brakes on. My friend catches on and comes and stands next to me. The worker comes over and says, you can go in now, seeing me not moving. I reply, how? You told me to put my wheelchair here. He, not seeing what's happening, replies, yes, so you need to leave it here and then go in and get it after. I ask him how that'll work and he sort of blinks at me confused, then walks over to a guest who has asked for help. Another worker who's older and has team leader on his badge comes over. The guy who has told me to sit there is still talking to another guest and the older worker comes over and asks if I'm okay. I explained that the guy had told me to sit here in my chair and so I did and then he told me to head into the ride but leaving my chair here and how I'm confused as I can't walk or stand. This worker is mortified and tells me this is obviously not the park rules and how no one is asked to leave their wheelchair there if they don't want to and how I'm allowed in with my chair. The first worker comes over and the supervisor slash team leader asks him what he's on about and how he can't tell wheelchair users to do this etc. The younger guy said he was told to tell people they could leave their wheelchairs there and we came to realize that he was just confused and thought everybody in wheelchairs could actually walk. The guy realizes his mistake and then realizes what I was trying to tell him earlier and he's mortified, apologizing over and over. I explain how it's okay and I'm glad he's realized what he said wasn't okay but I can see that he had been confused and it turned out he was very new. I head onto the ride and as I exit the supervisor comes over and refunds us our park entry tickets and has food and shop vouchers for myself and my friend. I explain how they didn't need to do this and how I'm just glad the new guy found out his misunderstanding with me who found it funny and I had a bit of a fun time messing with him. This company doesn't offer bribes until it does. This happened a year or two ago. I had just returned from a long mission for my company in Indonesia. As soon as I could finish the paperwork, I could go on leave. I had about three days of report writing left to do. I had been invited to a BS meeting on the company ethos, which I had declined. The HR underling sent an email saying that it was obligatory, which I ignored. Anyway, the meeting started without me. Then the HR person came out and said I had to attend. Room is full of techies, engineers, and anyone else who was in the office at the time. PowerPoint display went on and on, company ethos, other stuff, and then HR. What to do if you are offered a bribe, which made me smile. Anyway, HR, what's funny? Me, oh, nothing, HR, no, go on. 
So I asked if we were supposed to offer incentives in order to complete missions. Never, if you remember the PowerPoint we just worked through. So I quickly copy and pasted a section of my WhatsApp conversation with the missions officer, about four levels above HR Underling, and sent it to HR Underling's email. I just sent you something. She opened it and began to read. Missions manager was a sound guy who understands that in some countries, a little cash is the only way to make things function. Anyway, the email stated the case. I had a higher car, but I didn't have access to a driver all the time, and I was stuck in the hotel on weekends. Theoretically, you can use your home driving license to obtain an Indonesian driving license, and it should be straightforward. In reality, they see it as an opportunity to make some money and will happily make you wait for a year and do a driving test, unless you give a fat wad of banknotes in an envelope. 2 million Indonesian rupiah, about $130, but it's a lot to them. Mission manager says fine. I asked him, how can I put it through expenses? Missions manager, team building exercise, get a receipt. Code for make a fake one, which I did. I found a site on Google that let me make one. There are hundreds of sites like that. So I made one for four steak dinners with wine and loads of beer. I printed it out, messed it up, and then scanned it. It looked legit. Missions manager, looks good to me, approved. She was reading this on her laptop, but it was shared with a 70-inch screen behind her. She looked up, and everyone was smiling. HR underling. Okay, we'll break for coffee. I didn't come back. She didn't come looking for me. I went on vacation two days later. Entitled stepfather is stalking us by watching our outside home surveillance camera that he installed. Me and my stepdad have always been quite close. He's always been supportive and always been there for me more than my own father has been. Regardless, me and my girlfriend moved into my grandmother's house just over a year ago to help her around the house a little more. Me and my girlfriend, both having relatively nice cars, parked in the driveway. I asked if he would install a camera onto the house to keep an eye on them. He did this for me. I offered him the money and he didn't charge me anything. I didn't think anything of it until last autumn. I'd gone to visit my friend for the day, who lives about 80 miles away. I'd come home at about 7 p.m. and as my grandma went to bed, me and my girlfriend decided to go out for a bit of a date night. I got a phone call from my stepdad around 9.30 p.m. asking if I was okay as I wasn't home yet. I straight away knew he had checked the camera to see if I was home yet. I was fuming and told him I don't appreciate being clocked in and out. He took offense to this and thought I was being ungrateful. Since then, he hasn't really made any comments. But then a couple of months ago, me and my girlfriend had a baby. She was in the hospital for a while, and he kept checking when I was home from the hospital each evening. I know, because the minute my car got into the driveway, it was, Don't forget to put this in your car for tomorrow. Or if I stayed out for a while later, I'd get, When you get home, can you... Which suggests he knew I wasn't. I really didn't want him watching me. So a few weeks ago, he made it quite obvious he had checked if I was in before coming to visit with my mom. Fuming, I unplugged the camera from the internet so that I could only access it when I needed to. I wanted to see how long it would take him to notice the problem, but instead, he's been in a funny mood for a few weeks. Today, he came to inspect as it had gone down, and I openly and honestly told him I appreciate what he's done for us, but I don't want him stalking us. He threw a massive tantrum, accused me of being ungrateful, and tried guilt-tripping me by saying it's only because he cares. He then deleted it from his access, or so he claimed anyway. I don't mind him having access. It helps in keeping an eye on my grandma if she ventures out or anything. But I'm a grown adult who doesn't need clocking in and out. It massively breaches data protection. It's weird. And what winds me up the most is him having a tantrum about it. Take his down and get your own. They're not hard to install. It just takes an afternoon. You should also check around your house for any additional ones. I caught Karen, my dad's girlfriend, snooping through his bank account on his computer, so I exposed her as a gold digger. I'm 16, female. My dad, who's 36, male, has been dating Delia, who's 42, female, for a year. He introduced us three months ago, and to keep it short, I don't like her. When my dad's not around, she's super passive-aggressive, and I feel like she's constantly trying to compete with me and be like his favorite, or the better one. I honestly don't know how to explain it, I can't really discuss it with someone because it's not like I have any proof or anything. Yesterday, she came here at 8 a.m. because the three of us were supposed to spend the day together. But my dad got called in for an emergency and said he'll be back by 2 p.m. No problem. 
I sat at the kitchen where you have full view of the living room, not because I was watching her, but because I've always sat there to do homework. If I looked at her, all I could see was her back, so I thought she was on her phone. I had to go to my room to get some papers, and when I walked behind her to go to the stairs, I saw what she was doing. She was using my dad's laptop. He's an architect, so his laptop is really, really important, and he doesn't let anyone use it. I thought to myself, what? But couples are weird, and guessed that she was the exception. She's also in the field. She saw me, smiled, and I went upstairs, got my thing and came back down. I guess she thought I was going to my room for a while, because when I walked behind her again, she didn't notice me. She was seeing my dad's bank account, his Facebook, and his Instagram. She really had three things open at once, and I said, hey, you shouldn't be seeing that, and I took his laptop. She got red in the face and tried to make excuses like, I was trying to close them, it's not what you think, until she got mad and said that she was his partner and I had no right to snatch things from her hands and that I was being a jealous brat because daddy wasn't all mine anymore. She demanded an apology and I told her to get out until my dad came back because I wasn't comfortable having her around anymore. She did leave but called my dad crying and made a fake version of what happened. He came back mad but after I explained what had happened and he saw the living room footage, he knew I was telling the truth, apologized, and thanked me. My grandmother, on the other hand, is upset because she really loves Delia and said that I did act like a jealous daughter and that when you have a man, you have to make sure he's good and agreed that I should apologize because I acted like a huge jerk. You're not the jerk, and it's amazing your dad has your back. Let your other family members be mad. You did the right thing for your father. Simple. Not the jerk. Delia was crossing a boundary of your dad's, his rule that no one should touch his laptop, and on top of that, she was clearly invading his privacy by going into his online accounts. You defended his boundary because you knew she was crossing it and her behavior wasn't okay. Husband wrongly accused me of stealing from him, so I returned the shoes that I bought for him. I'm 29, and my husband, who's 36, is the breadwinner of the family. I stay home with the kids who are preschool age. He pays for the mortgage, bills, household needs, food, kids' needs, etc. He has set a monthly budget for each category and handles getting everything done. Recently, he's become overwhelmed and told me to handle grocery shopping, but before he let me, he asked me to write a list of all the stuff we need so he could calculate the total and also so he'd have an idea how much I'll be spending when I take his credit card. I didn't have an issue with that because this way we'd watch our spending habits. However, he said I'm never allowed to get something that isn't on the list unless I'm paying for it some other way. On Friday, I was doing some grocery shopping as usual and saw that the store had some nice shoes on sale. The price was insanely low for this brand and so I decided to grab a pair for my husband thinking that he'd be happy with them since he needed new sneakers anyway. I bought them and when I showed them to him, he flipped out on me saying I made a huge mistake by buying something that wasn't on the list. I agreed with him but I thought that since the shoes were for him then it would be different. He said I messed up and shouldn't have bought those sneakers without even telling him. But in my defense, I said that the price was low, so it's not like I spent $100 on shoes. And also, I saw this as a great deal and wanted him to have those nice sneakers. He plainly said that what I did is considered stealing since he never consented to have those sneakers purchased and said that I'm being irresponsible with money. That is why I no longer have an income and my spending habits need a grip. I felt hurt by what he said. We argued about it for hours and he avoided speaking to me for the rest of the day. The next day, I went and returned the sneakers and took the money back. He got home in the evening and lost it when he found out I returned them. He said he couldn't believe how petty and childish I was to actually do this. I explained I was just correcting my mistake. He tried to contact the store and was told the sneakers were already sold. He even got angry with me, but I told him that he accused me of stealing from him when I was just trying to do a nice gesture for him. He yelled that I had a lot of nerve, calling what I did a nice gesture while using his money to do it. I told him he had no right to yell at me after I corrected my mistake and gave back the money he accused me of stealing. He threw a fit, then went out with his friends and came home late at night still not talking to me. Did I mess up? Maybe I shouldn't have purchased them knowing they weren't on the list, but I just wanted him to have those sneakers and thought I was doing a nice gesture. Not the jerk. His money? Charge him for cooking, cleaning, laundry, general housekeeping, and childcare then. If you're a stay-at-home mom, he earns family income. This is not right. As for the argument that you stole his money to buy him a gift, it's beyond messed up. If you decide to stay with him, surely you should stop buying him birthday and Christmas presents. By his own logic, you are stealing from him. 
My mom took some time off work when my sister and I were very little and my dad worked. I was talking to him about it the other day and he said, I may have been earning the money, but there's no way I could have dedicated that much time to my job if your mom hadn't been doing so much at home. She earned it just as much as I did. We're a team. You're supposed to be working together, OP. Ask yourself how often your husband acts like you're on opposite sides. Not the jerk. Not the jerk, but I'm seriously concerned for you. Almost all couples in your same situation with only one breadwinner share finances, so you should have your own credit card and be able to make reasonable purchases without discussion. Am I the jerk for refusing to work from home so now people can no longer bring their dogs to the office? Hi, I'm 32, female. Here it goes. When everyone was working in the office, dogs were never even an option. Lockdown, shutdown, working from home. People trickled back in and they're allowed to bring their dogs to ease the transition. My group stays back for another year. Everyone's finally called back to the office. I'm allergic to dogs and the smell gives me migraines. Huge bummer because I do like dogs, but it explains why in one foster home I was always feeling sick. Boss says we'll figure something out. People with their own offices are not willing to give them up. Boss tells me that maybe it's best if I work from home. I live in a tiny studio that barely fits my bed and I have to sit on it or on my floor to have a workspace. I have one window. It's suffocating and I was starting to go crazy living there during lockdown and working from home. So I say that if I can negotiate a raise that will be enough to help me move to a larger place, I will consider working from home. Boss takes that to their boss, comes back and says unfortunately it's not in the budget. I say I'm not going back to working from home. Boss insists it couldn't be as bad as I'm saying and that everyone has to make adjustments. Mind you, Boss and most of my other coworkers live in houses that they own. Most have huge backyards, entire rooms to dedicate as an office, etc. So of course they don't think it's a big deal. I stand firm and remind them that someone can give me an office, but no one would. So unfortunately, everyone has to stop bringing the dogs to the office. Coworkers and other people in the building are saying I'm being selfish for not just taking the deal and going back to working from home because they had all love to be allowed to. When I've told people about the tiny apartment and how I can't afford more, they say things like, just move back in with your parents, or stop buying Starbucks, and start doing Uber and Uber Eats after work, and move to the suburbs, as if I'm choosing to be in this position just to spite them. Others have been like, why can't you just take a Claritin and tell me I'm making up the smell causing migraines? Each of them has a suggestion about how I should just go out of my way to make all these changes, some of which I can't even do, just because people want to bring their dogs to the office. Am I really the jerk for this? Thanks for the responses so far. I appreciate the judgments and they're giving me a lot to think about. Just as a note, due to circumstances I'd prefer to not get into too much, I cannot just go find a new job or a new place to live. These are things that are, for me, out of my control for the time being. Things will hopefully change in a few years. Not the jerk, but I'd start looking for a better job. People are jerks in an office and they won't get over this. Your environment there is only going to get worse. Not the jerk. If they want to be with their dogs so much, one of them should make the sacrifice of giving up their office or they should be given the option to work from home. Not the jerk. Dogs weren't permitted before lockdown. They shouldn't be permitted now. Yeah, it sucks leaving the fur babies at home, but it is what it is. I may be out of line with my thinking, but this could technically be considered discrimination because of a known medical condition. Maybe the threat of an EEOC complaint would straighten out your boss. Am I the jerk for letting my ex sign over his paternity rights before he knew the babies were his? Me, female, 42, and my boyfriend, male, 57, of four years split recently. We met while we were both going through divorces and we got together about six months after mine was final. His was final before mine. We lived in different towns, so we sometimes would go a couple of weeks between visits due to distance, but it worked for us. He has four kids, a son who's 37, daughter who's 35, son who's 14, another son who's 12, and has shared custody of the two youngest with his second ex-wife. I share two kids, my son who's 18, my daughter who's 16 with my ex-husband. It just hasn't made any sense for us to move closer due to having to fight with exes to change custody agreements. I found out eight months ago that I was pregnant. This was completely unexpected as he had a vasectomy after his last son was born. Neither of us had any intention to have more kids and I was not prepared to be pregnant at 41. I didn't even find out until I was almost five months along. I went to see him and his reaction was, well, he broke things off with me and had some very choice words to call me. He refused to believe anything other than that I was seeing someone else 
and trying to pin this pregnancy on him. His ex-wife cheated on him often, which is why they split, so part of me understands his emotional reaction, but he spent the last eight months ghosting me and has refused to even speak to me. The babies, twins, a boy and a girl, were born three months ago. I do not need his financial help, but I decided to file for child support so he would do a paternity test. Once his friend said he took the test, but before we had the results, which I never needed, he was the only person I had been with, I had him served with papers to sign over his parental rights and all financial responsibility as well. Unsurprisingly, he signed the papers without hesitation. We got the paternity test results back and now he's blowing up my phone and showing up at my house angry at me and saying I'm the jerk because I refuse to entertain the idea of getting back together or moving closer to him. He also says I tricked him into signing over his rights. I am aware he may be able to fight me as it is recent. Some of my friends and family are telling me I am the jerk for doing this to him and others say they understand why I did. So, dear Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit. I live in Colorado. We did have to go to court to relinquish his rights, but it was a very short visit. He did not deny paternity. He admitted to never wanting anything to do with the babies, that he had not met them, and that the distance between us would make it difficult to co-parent. My lawyer brought up his felony that he had abandoned the babies. The fact that I have both financial means and family support. The judge agreed termination was acceptable. I will apologize because after speaking to a few people, I'm learning it is rarely this smooth when my lawyer made it sound and seem so easy. I do know he can fight and possibly get his rights back and I'm undecided on if I would fight him on that. I am absolutely willing to co-parent with the man. I am not willing to forget what happened and just start dating again. Not the jerk. Why would you get back together with someone who accused you of cheating? He has nobody to blame but himself. And if he signed over rights and the kids weren't his, the papers wouldn't have meant a darn thing. Sounds to me like his family is giving him crap and now he wants to save face. OP. I do believe he really felt there was zero chance of the babies being his. I was 100% fine with a paternity test when I found out I was pregnant because of course with a vasectomy he was going to have concerns and that I could have dealt with. But ghosting me was childish and left me alone when I was feeling very vulnerable. Now he wants to be a family. He is a good dad and I would be okay with him being in the twins' lives, but I don't want to pass off kids every other week for the next 18 years. Karen X demands I send our son to a private school. So I, 32 male, had my son Ben, who's 14 male, really young. My girlfriend Ivy and I were both 18 at the time and we had just graduated high school. Ivy wanted to not have the baby, but I wanted to keep him. We agreed that she would carry him to term but that she'd sign over all parental rights to me and have no responsibility to raise him. I raised him alone for seven years until my wife, Jane, 34, female, came into the picture. Jane legally adopted Ben two years ago and was the only real mother figure in his life until one year ago when Ivy showed up again. She reached out to me via Facebook and asked to meet Ben. I told Ben what was going on and I gave him the choice. He said yes. The three of us met up at a diner and the two of them had a very emotional conversation. They've been in sparse contact ever since. Now, I didn't know this at first, but Ivy has since converted to Catholicism. Now, I have no issues with her religion. However, she recently contacted me and asked me to send Ben to a local Catholic private school for high school. He'll be a freshman next year. She explained that she wants Ben to know her faith and that the school has a good reputation. She even offered to pay two-thirds of the tuition, but I said no. Why did I say no? Neither Ben nor I are religious at all. I asked Ben if he wants to go to the Catholic school or the local public high school, and he said he'd rather go to the public school to stay with his friends. Tuition is quite expensive, and even one-third would be a financial burden. I've heard horror stories about things that happen at those schools, and I don't want to risk Ben getting hurt. Their curriculum isn't publicly available, and I don't know how they would teach science, other things, and history. I don't want him learning a bunch of stuff that I don't believe in. Even with all of these reasons, she's still Ben's mother and going against her wishes could risk their relationship. Would I be the jerk if I sent him to the public high school? Not the jerk. She signed over her parental rights at birth. You did more than enough to even consider it and give Ben the option. Also, the curriculum not being available to parents is a huge red flag. Also, Ben at age 14 is old enough to know that his opinion matters. Even if OP were in favor of the idea, it would still not be okay given Ben is against it. It would also not be okay if she, for instance, asked Ben to attend church against Ben's wishes. Not the jerk. She gave up her parental rights. She can raise her kids as she sees fit, 
but Ben is not functionally her kid to raise anymore and hasn't been for a long time. Am I the jerk for not inviting all of the students to a barbecue? I, 30 female, am a teacher. I have a class with 24 students. I teach first grade. I told my students that we could have a barbecue at a park with hot dogs and hamburgers and snacks for whoever filled their good noodle sticker charts. This has been approved by the principal and I teach at a private school. We have daily sticker charts to track their behavior. They had to have perfect behavior all of April in order to participate. I have one student who has some behavioral issues. They did not earn all of their good noodle stickers this month. Since this student, we'll call Bobby, didn't earn the barbecue, I had <laughs> barbecue. <laughs> Since this student, we'll call Bobby, didn't earn the barbecue, I had let his mother know just in case he mentioned it. Bobby would join another class for the day and do work inside while his classmates were at the barbecue. She's been sending emails complaining to myself and the principal all week about how her kid should also have been able to participate and it's unfair. She thinks we should make an exception since he has behavioral issues and feels we could be targeting him. I think I'm being fair because he did not earn all of his good noodle stickers. So, am I the jerk? Update. I had a meeting today after school with the parents and principal. The principal agrees it would not be fair to the other students to allow Bobby to participate. She expressed she understands the frustration, but she needs to make it fair for all of the students, and not just Bobby. The father said he understood and thought it was a fair assessment if all of the other students were able to complete the goal. The mother argued Bobby's IEP. The principal then reminded her we follow his IEP as a courtesy, but as a private school, we legally do not have to follow it and she has a choice to come to this school, but if she'd like to unenroll Bobby, then there was a waiting list of students they could contact to take his place. Bobby will still be enrolled in this school and in my class if anyone is wondering. He will not be attending the barbecue. Update 2. Bobby's mother came to the school yesterday to drop off Bobby's lunch he forgot at home. She arrived during the kids' snack recess. All of the kids were playing freeze tag, a game where once you're tagged, you have to freeze until someone unfreezes you. I was inside prepping art while the teacher's aide was with them. Bobby's mother came inside absolutely livid, saying we were forcing her kid to stand in one place and not let him move. We explained the game and she said then the students are cruel for not unfreezing him but unfreezing everyone else. She was making such a big scene and being so loud that the principal overheard. Their office is down the hall. His mother was removed from the school grounds and we had a meeting with his father in the afternoon. The principal let him know Bobby would need to be unenrolled due to his mother's behavior. He did try to get him to stay until at least the end of the year, but ultimately understood. He was also told if Bobby's mother is on the school grounds again, the police department will be called immediately. You're the jerk. As a former educator myself, I hate these kinds of public exclusionary rewards, especially for the very young kids. These are first graders. From what you've posted, it sounds like this was the only student excluded. There's literally no way that is going to encourage better behavior from this kid in the future. Kids, especially the younger ones, often act out in reaction to emotional stimuli they don't have the appropriate tools to process yet. 99% of the time, a kid of first grade age who is acting out has trouble somewhere, stress or problems at home, getting bullied, who knows. For the same reason it's unfair to punish younger kids for tardiness or attendance issues, it's unfair to expect a kid this young to behave all the time when you have no idea what might be happening in their lives that isn't in their control. Publicly excluding one kid is going to make behavioral issues worse. You're turning them into a pariah to their peers. Kids can be mean and honestly don't need much to single someone out as other. I know you want to use some kind of reward system for the kids who are behaving the way you want, but you're talking about six-year-olds. Something as big as a barbecue at the park should have been an all-or-nothing class goal. Singling out the one kid who's having trouble which again, you as the teacher will almost never know the true source of, is bullying. If these were high schoolers, that would be one thing. Teenagers are more mature and can be expected to have more control over their behavior. But we're talking about kids who are only 6 years old. You need to rethink your reward system, keeping in mind age-appropriate expectations for these kids. Edit. Some of your comments specify that the kid has an IEP. 100% you're the jerk. A kid that young who already has an IEP is never going to be able to meet that level of behavioral expectation, regardless of whatever accommodations the IEP calls for. Perfection for a month? You set this kid up to fail. Hopefully not on purpose, but that's still the outcome. Learn from this in the future.
Am I the jerk for calling my mom a heartless jerk? I have a four-year-old son and I had him when I was 16. It's a complicated situation. My parents said that the only thing they'd provide me with was my room and I had to care for the baby myself. It was hard, but it worked out in the end. My parents treat my son a lot nicer now too. My brother just turned 14 and he's the best. In fact, my son looks up to him and my brother adores him. My son made this drawing of him and my brother and gave it to my brother for his birthday. My brother loved it so much that he kind of brushed off the presents me and my parents gave him. It upset my parents, but they kept their mouths shut. My son draws so many pictures of him and his uncle now and he gives every single one to my brother and my brother puts every single one on his wall. My brother was at a sleepover and I had taken my son out for a fun day. When we got back, my son ran to my brother's room to show him something. The door was wide open and the first thing he noticed was that all of his drawings were gone. He just began to cry and cry and it took forever to calm him down. He eventually went to sleep. My brother came back the next day and when he went to hug my son, he started to cry. My brother was confused so I told him that he saw the empty wall. My brother was still confused so he went to his room and came back really upset. He said that he didn't do that and he's actually going to cry as well because he liked those drawings. My mom came down and he immediately confronted her and she just said that she didn't realize how much he liked those drawings and she took them down while she was cleaning his room. I was mostly shocked. She was there the night before when my son saw the wall and started crying and she was comforting my son and everything. I felt betrayed. I called her out for how she acted last night and she told me to relax, that I'm not allowed to speak to her like that. I honestly lost it and I called her a heartless jerk, my own mother. I felt bad the second I said it, but it felt good too. My mom looked so shocked and just turned back and went to her room. My dad confronted me later and yelled at me for what I said. He said that regardless of what she did, she's my mom and when he wanted to kick me out, mom's the one who convinced him to let me and my baby stay. Am I the jerk? I feel guilty now. Edit. She didn't take them down temporarily. She took them down and threw them out. And it wasn't just random drawings stuck to a wall. It was organized and laid out with a lot of care. Not the jerk. Wow, your mom has some serious jealousy issues going on there. I really hope she doesn't cause any damage to the relationship between your brother and your son. Not the jerk. Sounds like your mom's playing mind games. It's obvious that they mean a lot to both your son and your brother. A 14-year-old wouldn't put up stuff all over their walls that they didn't want up. Sounds like she was stirring the pot purposefully to try to get a reaction from you so that she can come in and save the day by letting you stay. So she both caused the issue and she's the good guy in the situation. Not the jerk. You can apologize for calling her names for your own conscience and if this was truly out of character thing for her to do, but don't back down on pointing out how what she did was wrong and hurt both her son and grandson immensely. There was no good reason for her to throw those drawings out and she can't justify it either. Also, your mom doesn't get an award for being a decent parent when your dad wanted to throw you out. That was quite literally her job. Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit because of $10? So I, 16 male, live next door to a single mom, Anne, and her two kids, Max, who's 9, and Mia, who's 7. Every month or so, when she needs a break from them, I babysit for a few hours, 8.50 an hour. She's usually gone for 4 hours at a time and is back around 15 minutes later than her specified return time. She leaves me with a list of emergency contacts in case something happens and she can't get home fast enough. We agreed that if I had to use an emergency number, I get $10 extra as crisis pay. The last time I was watching the kids, around a month ago, Anne stayed out an hour and a half past her specified return time and wasn't answering my texts or calls. I got worried, so I called one of the emergency contacts, Anne's sister, Jen, who came over to stay in the house while she tried to get a hold of Anne. The kids were asleep by this point, but she didn't want to leave them in an empty house, and I went home. Well, as it turns out, Anne had driven into the countryside, with no reception, to stargaze and got lost. Jen texted me this around midnight once Anne finally texted her back. The next morning, my mom woke me up, saying that Anne was at the door for me. Here's how the conversation went. Me, a little groggy. Hey, what's up? Are you okay? Anne. I'm alright. I just stopped by to pay you. She handed me an envelope. There you go, kiddo. 47 bucks. Me. Wait. What about the crisis pay? I had to call your sister. It should be 57. What crisis? 
I wasn't in an accident or anything. I just got lost. Me. You said it was if I had to use an emergency contact. You never said anything about other requirements. Look, just take it and be happy. A kid like you doesn't need that much money for five and a half hours of messing around on your phone. Me. Fine. Have a nice day. I shut the door and write it off as a loss. Fast forward to yesterday. Anne texts me that she wants to go out on a girl's night and wants to know if I'm free to babysit. I say that I am, but that she'll need to pay me the $10 from last time before I agree to it. She says that she won't do that and restates her argument that it wasn't a real crisis, so I shouldn't get crisis pay. I tell her that I won't be babysitting for her until I get that $10. She says that she really needs this break and calls me entitled for refusing. I step back into bewilderment. A few minutes go by without any more texts from her, so I go to my mom to clue her in. I show her the conversation, and to my surprise, my mom agrees with Anne. She affirms that I'm being entitled, that I don't know how hard it is to be a single mom, and that I should suck it up and just babysit. I say that I need time to think, and I head up to my room. This morning, Anne texted me to ask if I would babysit or not. I restated my ultimatum, and she also held firm in her refusal. She said she'll find another sitter. I said that's fine. So far, I've stood my ground, but now I'm questioning if my mom might be right. Am I the jerk? Nope, nope, nope. Not the jerk. You provided a service with agreed-upon clauses, and you used said clause, and she's trying to weasel out of paying you back because she doesn't consider your time valuable. I personally wouldn't babysit for her again because she will try to manipulate you again. Edit. Also, just because you're just a kid and you don't need that much money, you should let her know that regardless of your age, you're still a person who deserves to have their time and effort respected. Not the jerk. You have the right to refuse to offer your paid services to anyone. Additionally, that counts as a definite crisis. The kid's mom was nowhere to be found. Also, it's not your responsibility to be captain save a single mom. Am I the jerk for not inviting my dad's wife to the wedding? I, 24 female, got engaged last May to my fiancé, 24 male. I'm very excited about it, but when it came down to planning, I knew that my parents would be a tough situation. My parents separated when I was 16 and didn't get officially divorced until 2020. My dad remarried in 2021. I'll refer to his wife as Sharon. During the initial separation, my sisters and I stayed with our mom. She was going through such a hard time. My dad, in the beginning, attempted to make an effort with my sisters and me, but it was very obvious that he was eager to start his new family. He eventually became a distant father, only really talking to us around holidays, taking Sharon and her kids on trips and bonding with them. I missed my dad, but he seemed to have already moved on from us and he was never a good person to communicate with. I still attempted to have some sort of relationship, even if it was at arm's length. I invited him to my high school and college graduation, which he attended both without Sharon. When Sharon and my dad got engaged, none of us were happy about it, but it was what he wanted. We went to the wedding. All three of us were very emotional about it, which family on my dad's side could tell and they tried to comfort us. I've never been mean to Sharon. I've always just sort of tolerated her. We never formed any kind of bond and I only ever saw her if I was visiting my dad, which already was once in a while. The same applies for my sisters. So, now, being engaged, I've taken everything in. I decided I wanted my dad at my wedding, but just as my dad. He wouldn't get a plus one or anything of the sort. To make things fair, I set the same rules for my mom. This past weekend, I went to talk to him and Sharon. My fiancé was with me when I told them. I said that I meant no disrespect, but I had to also think of my mom and that this would be easier. I also made it a point to tell him that my mom isn't allowed to bring anyone either. If Sharon wanted to celebrate our wedding, we could always also do dinner another time. I thought letting them know in advance, since the wedding isn't until fall of 2024, he would hopefully take it well and still want to show up. I was emotional, and afterward he did hug me and told me that he would let me know their decision. I left feeling better, but things changed. On our way home, he called me. He asked if this was my decision, which I said yes to. Then he told me that we could do dinner another time and essentially his answer was no. I was upset, so we just said our goodbyes and that was that. Edit. Some asked why I don't want Sharon there and I commented my explanation. Here it is. She was part of the reason my father left. In no way do I consider my mother the better parent in everything, but she wanted to work and try. Sharon was my father's coworker. When he left, he immediately moved in with her, 
and if I'm honest, my sisters and I have never seen her as a stepmother, but more so as our dad's girlfriend or wife. There's just no relationship there. I will admit, I never fully tried, but I was young when I was navigating everything, and I had no idea how to handle it. There was also no effort on her end. That has led to where I am today in my relationship with her and my father. No jerks here. You set boundaries, he respected them, but ultimately decided to not attend. You have every right to allow or disallow anyone you want to your wedding, but he has the right to decline your invite. It sounds like you both handled it well and that he respects your decision. Honestly, when you implied your dad was eager to start his new family and that he became distant to you and was doing more with his new stepkids, I wondered why you'd even invite him to your wedding at all. What a tool, not the jerk. I think ultimately no jerks here. In your dad's defense, your mom and him have been separated for eight years now. Both should be able to be cordial in a public setting, and let's be real, Sharon isn't going anywhere. She'll be around for holidays, birthdays, celebrations, and other things. It's not completely realistic to establish a baseline where your dad's partner is not permitted at big family moments. However, it does sound like your relationship with your dad has been strained since the separation, and that you two have never found your way fully back together. Nor does it sound like you and Sharon found some shared ground, so it makes sense why you may not want her there. Sit and look pretty instead of doing actual work? Okay. For the sake of clarity, I'm going to say I work in an industry which is similar to warehousing. Same logic in the grand scheme of things. In my branch and several surrounding branches, there are only two staff members to keep the place running, so we all have casual uniforms. Just a polo shirt and appropriate pants and footwear. I mainly do administrative work, and I have a team member who works in the back end of things, but I'm capable and willing to jump outside when required of me. Examples of me needing to work in the back would be if we had a huge rush, or if I need to send my teammate to help at another branch or out on the road to collect stock, and I have to fill in for him while he's gone. It's a pretty good setup, because working outside really breaks up the monotony of being stuck at a desk all day, and it's easy enough to do both parts of the job when I need to. Some genius in head office decided he wanted to change the uniform for any and all admin staff to something a little more corporate and dressy. I can only describe this uniform as a three-piece suit made with the heaviest fabrics known to man. Suddenly, I've gone from wearing a polo shirt, which is comfortable and easy to move around in, to wearing a white long sleeve business shirt with a vest, jacket, and handkerchief, complete with skirt, stockings, and slight heels. I straight up look like a flight attendant working in an industrial warehouse and can barely lift my arms high enough to hold my steering wheel on the drive to work. It was a poorly designed uniform and I was so incredibly uncomfortable wearing it. I was very quick to voice my anger. I first mentioned how it's unfair, borderline cruel, to expect staff to wear such a thick and layered uniform when we live in Australia, particularly in a place known for our consistent high temperatures and harsh sun. I then asked how I would be expected to leave the desk to operate machinery and do heavy lifting in a suit, skirt, and heels. I was met with the promise that anyone working in admin and wearing a corporate uniform would not have to leave their desk to do any back-end work at all. I raised another concern, stating that we did not have enough staff for them to make this particular promise and still maintain our quality of work and hit our deadlines, and was met with a strong guarantee that I would not have to do any physical work in my day-to-day -day operations. I was all but ordered to sit at the desk to look appealing for clients and never move from there. Okay then, no problem. From that point onwards, I followed their instructions. I never left my desk. There would suddenly be long wait times for orders and fulfillments because my team member was on the road on a job and there was no one on site to continue his work until he got back. If my team member called in sick, I would spend the day pushing back deadlines with clients which affected our targets and our reputation. Funny enough, my teammate only started getting sick because I had to have the office air conditioning on freezing temperatures so I wouldn't get a heat stroke at my desk. I was honest with clients who had complaints and explained that I would usually step in to help make sure their needs were met, but was specifically instructed not to anymore, and then redirected their complaints through to customer service and head office. After a few months of this, I was invited to a meeting with three of my direct managers and an HR representative. They were clearly upset about the drop in productivity and amount of complaints we were receiving. I let them all say their piece before reminding them I raised these concerns to them months ago and was merely following instructions given to me, which were abundantly clear that I was to take care of admin work at my desk and do nothing else. I let them know my hands were tied, 
so all I could do was look pretty and placate clients when we inevitably couldn't meet their needs as promised. I suggested hiring more warehousing staff to fill in the gaps left by the admin staff who were now chained to their desk by their uniform and unable to ease the pressure of the workload like we used to. I could see that comment definitely hit them right where I wanted it to and they couldn't argue with me for following their instructions. So I was told they would get back to me on a solution moving forward. Well, here I am at work two weeks later, typing this post while wearing my old polo shirt uniform. I was fully prepared to find another job if their solution wasn't reasonable, and maybe I still will look to leave this place. But I'll take the win for now. Am I the jerk for not telling her there was crawfish in the pasta? Context. I, 29 female, live in South Louisiana. All my family is from the area, Mississippi, and Texas. Our family had a cookout on Sunday for my mom's 60th birthday. It was at me and my husband's house. We did a majority of the cooking. I made crawfish, Cajun fettuccine, and husband made potato salad. We also had deviled eggs, cheese and fruit plate, boudin, and green beans brought by others. It was about 22 people over. My brother, 26 male, and his girlfriend, Brittany, who's 24, were there. Brittany is a transplant from Ohio. She's been here for a little under two years. She's been with my brother almost just as long. Brittany is vocal about hating shellfish, especially crawfish and shrimp. She has said that they are bugs and water roaches and they gross her out. My family, especially my dad and uncles, tease her about not liking shellfish, but it's not malicious. At the cookout, I didn't see Brittany or my brother until everyone settled. I saw Brittany was at a table with an empty bowl. She told me she loved the fettuccine and ate two servings. I told her that there was crawfish, head fat, and some other back straps in it, so I was surprised she enjoyed it. My uncle was at the table talking to my brother and said some comment about how they'll make her a real southern girl yet. Brittany immediately looked embarrassed and got very quiet. I left her alone after that as it seemed like she didn't want to talk. My brother took me aside later and said Brittany was upset and thought I purposefully tricked her into eating crawfish. I told him that wasn't true but he said I should have made it more obvious about the fettuccine. I honestly didn't think to tell her. I was very busy, so it wasn't at the front of my mind. I wanted to talk to her, but my brother said not to, as she was already in their car and she and my brother left the cookout early despite me trying to get them to stay. I talked to my cousin about this. She thinks Brittany feels very othered and singled out. I get it, but that's not the case here, and I feel like she was being dramatic, especially since my brother left early on our mom's birthday. Am I the jerk? No jerks here. I understand why you didn't tell her, but given how much of a hard time she had been given about the issue, I absolutely understand why she was upset. She probably is now preparing herself to be pressured into eating shellfish for the rest of the time she knows your family. People will be total jerks about it because they already have been. Teasing people for their preferences is so rude, and now that she's eaten it once, you know they will never let up. You say the teasing isn't malicious, but does it make her uncomfortable? If yes, then they need to stop. We aren't required to like the food people think we need to like, and liking it in one dish doesn't mean we're going to ever want to eat it again. You know they'll never let her forget this. We all know these kinds of people and they're awful. I hurt for her. I'd be surprised if she ever comes to a family dinner again because she just doesn't want to deal with the teasing. Oh no, being teased about not liking crawfish. The horror, the horror. Oh, you know how it is these days, Karen. Some people's biggest problem in life is figuring out what they're going to watch on Netflix today. New neighbors keep using our pool without permission. Should I call the cops on them? I'm 32, female. My wife and I finally bought our own home instead of renting. It took a lot of work, but we did it. And it's a home we both love and plan to spend the rest of our lives in. It even has a pool, which is just amazing and something I'd always wanted but never thought I'd have. The issue is our next door neighbors. I keep finding their kids using our pool, having hopped our fence, and I keep getting them to leave. I've spoken to their parents about this issue, and they've told me that the elderly couple we bought the house from would let them use the pool in exchange for cleaning it, so they're just used to being able to use it. I told them that was fine when it was the last neighbor, but it's something my wife and I are not comfortable with as we don't know them well enough. Plus, if they were to get hurt, we'd feel awful about it. They insist that nobody would get hurt and asked if it would be okay if they used it whenever we weren't using it, as they're just kids, and spoke about how it's getting hotter now. I was getting annoyed at this point and told them they should get their own pool then, and I'd already told them we weren't comfortable with this. Ever since then, I've had to chase them away a couple more times, and their parents are constantly sending me dirty looks whenever they see me. 
I've since posted a sign stating it's a private pool and can only be used with permission. Am I really being unfair here? Yes, it sucks that they had an arrangement with the last owners, but it's our pool now. Not the jerk. You know those parents would sue you into the next century if someone got hurt in your pool. You need to have your pool totally fenced off with a locking gate. I would also report the kids to the police as trespassing, if only to put the parents on notice. OP should tell the neighbors that next time they will call the cops. And if they don't take the warning seriously, actually call the cops. OP has already put signs up and everything, and the law is on OP's side. You are wrong. The law is not on OP's side. A pool is an attractive nuisance, and regardless of signs, fence, etc., OP is liable. I had all this stuff, fence, alarm, etc., and lost a lawsuit when a known neighborhood nuisance hopped the fence, was drunk, and ended up passing. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter that I can't compete with her stepmom, and that if she can't cope with it, she should live there full time? 15 years ago, I, 19 at the time, dated this guy, Mark, who was 25. I got pregnant after a few months with him. I wasn't ready for a kid, so I gave Mark full custody of our daughter, Natalie, who's now 14, and I'd visit a couple of times a year. Mark is from a good family and already had a great job when we first met. He quickly climbed up the ladder and was able to give Natalie a very privileged life. When Natalie was two, he met Amy and they got married when Natalie was four. Natalie and Amy have always been very close and Amy is very much involved in her life. She's room mom, head of the PTA. She was the soccer coach, the softball coach, head of the theater guild, and found a way to be part of everything Natalie was involved in. She also drives Natalie to school early in the mornings so they could stop for breakfast first, and she packs Natalie's lunch every day, and not something like peanut butter and jelly in a bag of chips. She makes Natalie steak or quiche or lettuce wraps with a side of salad with homemade dressing, fresh fruit, and homemade dessert. Natalie doesn't understand that the only reason Amy is able to do all of this is because she doesn't work and she doesn't have to do much around the house. They have a cleaning service come multiple times a week. I recently got an apartment close to Mark and Amy's house and I have Natalie one week out of the month now. It was pretty hard for both of us at first. Natalie had a hard time understanding that we're not stopping for breakfast before school and the best thing she's going to get from me for lunch is a turkey sandwich, cookie from the grocery store I work at, a bag of chips, and an apple. She was also not used to the fact that she has to clean up after herself. Natalie was here last week and we were already not getting along because she had an event at school that week that she told Amy about and not me, because she refused to clean her room and because I found out she's been throwing away the lunches I make for her and asking Amy to bring her lunch since she started staying with me. She had a sore throat on Wednesday and I let her stay home from school, then started to get ready to leave for work. When I was about to leave, she made a comment that Amy always stays home with her when she doesn't feel well. I said it's a sore throat and she'll be fine, but she got an attitude and said that I should try to be a good mom like Amy. We ended up arguing and I told her that I can't compete with Amy and that if she can't handle that, she needs to go back to her dad's house. So she called Amy to pick her up and I haven't heard from her since. I was supposed to take her out for dinner this Saturday, but now she doesn't want to go, so I wanted to know if I was the jerk. You're the jerk. Your daughter may have your DNA, but you aren't her mother. She's been through a dramatic change when you stepped back into her life. Because of that, your expectations for this relationship aren't realistic. She's 14 and you literally abandoned her at birth. You have a golden opportunity to get to know the young woman she's becoming, but you've turned this situation into a competition between you and her mother. You cannot blame her at all for not wanting to spend time with you. I don't understand how OP turned it into a competition. Given the example provided in the post, what was she supposed to do? Miss work to stay home with Amy and lose money and day off for a non-emergency? Just because her stepmother doesn't work and could actually stay with Amy in such a situation because she A. is not employed, B. doesn't rely on the money from work. There was a no win for OP there. The kid literally demands stuff OP can't provide, like breakfast at cafes, because she cannot afford it on a single income, presumably. Your comment contains no actual advice of what she was supposed to do apart from generic, do better. Edit. Just to clarify, there are different issues here. OP is not the jerk for the situation described in the post, and that's what I refer to in this comment. However, she appears to be the jerk for forcefully inserting herself into the life of this teenager by fighting Natalie's parents in court for custody, instead of simply agreeing to visitation rights. All this presumably in response to Amy wanting to adopt. Not the jerk. I think you need a full stop and try to imagine how you'd feel if you were your daughter. She's been given a very nice life by her father and stepmom, 
you were rarely in the picture, and that's when it suited you. Now you decided to become a mom, and you think this human whom you birthed should be so happy to have you in her life. I wouldn't. I'd be upset if I had to leave the comfort of my home to go stay with a stranger for a week every month, simply because she decides to move close enough that it's convenient for her. You've uprooted her. You're not helping her to adapt. You expect her to be happy you're around, and you're mad because she isn't. You pull her away from her comfort for an entire week and take her to a place that's clearly less than she's accustomed to, and you're mad because she's not happy? She's 14. 14-year-olds aren't happy anyway, and you're giving her way more reasons to be unhappy. My friend's girlfriend demands I pay for her meal at the restaurant. So at a local restaurant recently, I went there with my girlfriend, her sister, my friend, his girlfriend, and three other friends. So as you can imagine, there were eight of us at the table, and it was crowded in the restaurant already, so the waiters weren't really happy to see such a big group turn up and have to seat them. It started to get awkward when they couldn't see a free table immediately, but eventually they did and we all sat down. I originally offered to pay, as I had invited all of them out, and I had never had the liberty of paying, not even once. I unfortunately do have some money problems because of gambling, but I've been clean for two years now, and I've really been getting on with my life, with a new job and better pay. Even with the struggle, I thought I could easily pay for everyone, but apparently not. I thought people would know unofficial boundaries for money spending, but I wasn't expecting what happened with my friend's girlfriend. She asked who's paying. I said me, and she then began to eat and make sure that she chose the most expensive thing she could find on the menu. I thought, she can't be serious right now, but I thought, let's just see where it goes. Surely she knows what someone would want to pay for, but I was wrong because after about an hour and 30 minutes of this and four rounds of drinks for her, I said to a waiter, can I have the check? When he came back, it came to a grand total of just over 260 pounds. I was astonished. I could afford it, but that doesn't mean that I want to pay for it. So I refused to pay for her bill of 113 pounds and I asked her for the full amount and some form of payment towards it. She refused and called me a jerk. I originally believed she was taking advantage of my generosity but now I understand that she's normally like this. I've never gone out with her before. But her accusation made me rethink myself and I had to ask myself, was I the jerk? Which I can't decide on internally. Not the jerk. It's an unwritten rule that if someone else is paying, you let them set the pace for expenditure. She accounted for nearly half the bill when there were eight people eating. The full bill was 260 and her portion was 113? That's $147 divided between the rest of you. If this math is correct, then you are definitely not the jerk here. Wow, the audacity of some people. Everyone sucks here. Mostly her, because it seems like she was taking advantage, especially because she asked who was paying before ordering. But you say that she's normally like this, so if she's used to four drinks at dinner and was planning on doing that either way, you're paying for seven out of eight people. I doubt she ordered four drinks at once, so once she ordered more, you just had to say, hey, I know I said I'm paying, but I can't afford more than an entree and one drink per person, so past that, you're gonna have to pay, rather than waiting until the end. Stepmother tried to hijack our baby shower. My fiance, Jane, found out she was pregnant in June of 2021, and we announced it to our immediate families in August. At first, stepmother was completely uninterested in our baby. Not that I expected much from the woman whose reaction to our pregnancy announcement was to ask Jane if she was sure it was mine, even my dad berated her for that one, but she barely seemed to acknowledge the fact that we were expecting. Instead, she was more interested in my stepbrother, who was also engaged, and would give her beautiful grandbaby soon. No complaints. We didn't want her involved, and we didn't even have to say anything. Planning our baby shower was complicated. Both me and Jane would have to work until the holidays, and I wanted to be involved. The due date was in February of 2022, so we decided early January was the best period of time. We enlisted two people as planners, my sister Laura and Jane's best friend Nina. Me and Jane are mostly laid back people. We didn't want a big party, nor did we want to spend too much money on it. We were saving for both our baby and the wedding. We decided early on that the shower would be co-ed. It would also have to be indoors, again January, and we settled on a guest list of 25 people, plus about a dozen kids. We came up with the idea of a pizza party. Me, Jane, and Luke, my brother-in-law, have had homemade pizza nights weekly since I moved in, and we thought it would be fun to incorporate that into the baby shower. Nina found an event venue with a pizza oven, and Laura figured out ways to incorporate classic baby shower stuff into the theme. 
the resulting plans were awesome. Make your own pizzas and non-alcoholic drinks. Nina and Laura mixed pizza decor with baby decor and found pizza-shaped sweets. It almost seemed messy, and I was surprised that they made it work, but we loved it. Most of the planning was finished by the middle of November. Well, later that month, my stepbrother's fiancé left him for her ex. They'd been together for four years at that point, and it was both sudden and horrible for him. He was devastated. Stepmom then realized the grandkids she dreamed of would take longer to come than she had thought. So naturally, without her son's milestone to obsess over, she moved on to mine. Suddenly, stepmom went from aloof relative to excited grandma-to-be. Facebook posts, tacky, promoted to Nana shirts, the whole nine yards. At first, we were too busy finishing things up at work and getting ready for the holidays to worry about that, but it didn't take long for her to start pestering us about planning the baby shower, as well as a gender reveal. We denied the possibility of a gender reveal party. No offense to those who like them, but we don't. Plus, we had decided to wait until birth to find out. Stepmom tried to get us to find out and tell her as a Christmas present, but we didn't. We also denied her the baby shower. She told my father, and he talked Laura into letting stepmom help out with the plans. She was still living with her at the time, so she didn't have much of a choice. She called Nina, and they met stepmom for coffee. Though I wasn't there for that meeting, Laura told me what happened later. Before they could even mention their plans, stepmom started talking about hers. According to Laura, she pulled out a shockingly thick binder complete with the words, oh baby, on the cover, colorful tabs and pieces of fabric poking out from her bag, and then she skipped to the shower section. It was short compared to the rest of the binder, but still long, and it was all to describe her one and only baby shower project. Laura sent me pictures, and oh boy. I'll give her this. It looked like the most Instagrammable baby shower ever. That being said, it was also barely functional and obviously expensive. There were balloons, oversized teddy bears, giant alphabet blocks, and cringeworthy signs everywhere. Stepmom was going for pretty over cozy, with uncomfortable chairs and some fancy food ideas that didn't look edible. Most of them had soft cheeses, which Jane couldn't even eat. The color palette was just three different shades of pink with gold accents. We'd be fine with a pink baby shower if it at least tried to mix things up a little, but Stepmom's pictures looked like Barbie had puked all over Hello Kitty's birthday party. When Nina tried to remind her that we didn't know the gender yet, Stepmom said she just knew that it was a girl. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Stepmom also wanted an all-female, child-free party with fancy caterers and alcohol. She had written down a guest suggestion list containing some of her closest friends, neither mine nor Jane's moms were even on it, and planned party games that no one had any interest in trying out. Basically, the only thing everyone could agree on was to hold the party indoors. Laura and Nina weren't given an opportunity to show her their plans until she was done. Once they could, they explained that while they could find a way to incorporate some of stepmom's ideas, they had already settled on the pizza theme. She tried to protest, but Laura stated that it was kind of them to even offer that, as the shower was a month away and we had already greenlit their plans. Stepmom even called me to try to get me to change their minds, but I just repeated their words. My dad had found out he couldn't come to the shower, so he didn't get a say in anything anymore. The holidays came around and the subject was dropped. Stepmom seemed to be okay with the pizza party. Nina managed to pair some of the pink decor she had wanted with matching blue stuff and even added one of the huge teddy bears. Fast forward to a week before the shower. Jane was almost eight months pregnant. Everything had been bought, all guests had RSVP'd, and pretty much everything else was ready to go. The shower was set to start at 7 p.m. Stepmom offered to get to the venue earlier to prepare everything. Laura agreed, mostly because she knew stepmom would complain if she didn't get to do anything, and the venue even let them drop off their decorations before the party. Me and Jane promised to get there at 6. Two days before the shower, however, the venue called Nina. They told her that stepmom had stopped by to drop off large, heavy boxes of what she called a little surprise for us. She had informed them that she planned on showing up at 3.30pm to start setting it up. They were calling to reinforce that the venue was only booked past 4 p.m. since stepmom almost threw a tantrum when told that. All of the decor was still at Nina's place, so she called Laura to check if they had left anything with stepmom. Thankfully, my sister is both smart and used to this crap, so she drove to the venue the next day and asked to see stepmom's boxes. She told me that she wasn't even surprised at its contents when she opened them, but was still shocked at stepmom's audacity. All of the boxes were filled with pink, frilly decorations. 
Some of them seemed to be the exact same items stepmom had initially shown Laura and Nina. The signs, the balloons, the placemats, everything. Laura realized that's why stepmom intended to get to the venue earlier, to set up the baby shower she had planned and pretty much force us all to party in Barbie City with her. She called Nina to figure out what to do. Neither of them could come at 4 p.m., so it was almost inevitable for stepmom to get her way. The most obvious solution they came up with was to throw everything away. But Laura had a better idea. That night, they called me and Jane. Hey, want to destroy a party in two hours? Laura got home and invited stepmom to go to a salon with her, lying about having coupons. Stepmom agreed, and they planned on going right after stepmom was done preparing the baby shower. At 4 p.m. the next day, stepmom got to the venue. She was done setting things up by 5. I'll admit, the woman is fast, and quickly left to go meet Laura at the salon. Once they were together, Laura texted Nina that the coast was clear. After that, me, Jane, and Nina went to the venue. Sure enough, stepmom had prepared her party. To make this shorter, I won't describe it, but I will say it was so pink, it almost gave Jane nausea. For the next two hours, Laura distracted stepmom at the salon while the three of us quickly took down every piece of decor stepmom had put up and replaced it with the pizza party stuff. We set up the activities, made up the tables, and put every pink item we found back in stepmom's boxes. It was actually really fun. We were done only minutes before the shower started. A handful of guests arrived before stepmom did, so I barely saw her all night. Laura told me that when they got there, stepmom's jaw dropped as she tried to make sense of what had happened to all of her pink decor. My sister just smiled, whispered, nice try, in her ear, and went to help Luke customize a bodysuit. Overall, the baby shower was everything we had hoped for. Our friends were there, people had fun, and we had a ton of pizza. So I didn't really care that stepmom spent the whole party literally sulking in the corner. Nina did catch her trying to put little pink bows on top of the cupcakes, but she quickly shut that down. I give Laura and Nina full credit for saving the day. Stepmom's interest in our baby quickly stopped after that. She stopped wearing her Nana shirts, didn't come to see us at the hospital when he was born, and refused to even acknowledge that he was a boy until she met him weeks later. Up until we went no contact, she was a very loose definition of the word grandmother. I couldn't be more grateful my son will never know her. You are required by law to make change for me right now. Years ago, I worked at a convenience store, and this store handled a lot of cash. We had a sign stating bills over $20 were only accepted with manager approval. In practice, we could accept them after using the detector pen and visual inspection. We also had a policy that we had to keep the cash in the drawer under a certain amount. We had a safe system to make drops and get change, but it had limits and timers when dispensing. Depending on what was needed, it could take 30 minutes to make change for a $100 bill. I was solo on graveyard, kept my drawer low, and didn't have to request change often. The drawer had five slots for bills and five pockets for coins, but we only kept ones, fives, tens, twenties in the slots. Other bills and checks were put under until we had enough for a drop. The extra coin pocket was used for dollar coins, half dollar coins, coins people left. Some people would tell us to keep the change, etc. If someone was a few cents short, we'd use the spare change. I kept my drawer under the limit. When I was on graveyard, I was solo and kept my drawer very low and didn't have to request change often. One night, one of our odd regulars came in and bought a bunch of stuff. He paid with Sacagawea dollar coins. They didn't fit in the safe tubes, so I had to keep it in the drawer. It was just over $100 in coins. I spread it out over all of the slots so one side wouldn't get too heavy. The drawer would stick out if it was too lopsided. I had also made a lot of change for payphones, the air and water machines, people buying items to get change for laundry, etc. I was down to three $1 bills, the Sacagawea dollar coins, zero quarters, a few dimes and some nickels, and a bunch of pennies. A guy comes in and up to the register with a 10 cent candy. He slaps a $100 bill on the counter. I ask him if he will be getting anything else, and he says no. I ask if he has anything smaller. He says no. So I tell him, don't worry then, the candy is on the house. I can use the have a penny, leave a penny money. He gets mad and says he won't take charity and I need to make change for him. I try to explain that we don't have the cash in my drawer and it would take 30 minutes to get the change, but he keeps interrupting and not listening. He yells, You are required by law to take my legal tender and make change for me right now. All full of attitude and jerkiness. So I said, Okay. He acts smug like he wants something when I pick up the bill. 
I pull out my detector pin and he starts complaining and moaning. I use the pin in view of the camera, then I hold the bill up to inspect it in view of the camera. I then put the bill in a safe tube to drop it as we were supposed to drop large bills on graveyard before even opening the drawer, then make the slip and drop that after. The customer is still standing there smugly grumbling and I enter the amount tendered into the register. Now the counter is raised and the drawer is just below the counter, so it's out of reach of customers unless they lean in reach. It also doesn't pop open like usual this time because of the weight of the coins. I open the drawer and push the three singles back in their slot so that the customer can't see them, even if he leans over to look in the drawer. He's being dramatic and turning to make a show of how long he's waiting, and can you believe this, to an audience of no one, so he doesn't notice at first that I'm pulling out all of those coins. I pull out the 88 cents or so in change, mostly nickels, and then start pulling out the Sacagawea dollar coins and putting them on the counter. He turns around and sees the coins and asks, What is this? So I tell him, I am required by law to accept legal tender and make change. You are required by law to accept legal tender as change. This is what I have available. He continues having a fit, saying, You should have told me. I tell him, I tried explaining, sir, but you interrupted and insisted I make change. And I go back to counting out the 99 Sacagawea dollar coins. He's silent for a bit and asks me, how am I supposed to get this home? I told him I'm not responsible for his change after I give it to him. He eventually gathers it up in his shirt. He pulled the bottom hem of his shirt about halfway up to make like a large pseudo pocket and slinks off. Edit 1. I added a couple of things to make it clear. Sacagawea dollar coins are dollar coins that are golden colored and a little bit bigger than a US quarter. They were not very widely used and were disliked by many. They also were too big to fit in many coin machines or counters especially those made before the year 2000. They also didn't have the coin roll blinks for them to my knowledge. I don't think the Sacagawea dollars are minted anymore, but they are in circulation. Edit 2. Yes, I'm aware. There is no requirement to accept large bills for a purchase. I just wanted to get rid of the coins and mess with the jerk. Would I be the jerk to insist my neighbor keep a yard schedule? For background, I have a severely reactive rescue dog. She's terrified of other dogs and freaks out majorly when she sees them or hears them. My partner and I have been working with our vet and a behavioral trainer and we've made some progress, but my dog is still not truly comfortable anywhere but her own yard. A new lady just moved in next door and she has two big dogs. They seem like nice dogs, they're quiet and she works with them a lot. The problem is that she works from home full time and her dogs are always outside. She doesn't leave them there for hours or anything but I never know when she's going to let them out or for how long. She also spends a lot of time out there with them after work and on weekends. I can hear her training and playing fetch, or she'll have them out with her while she's doing yard work. To be fair to her, she trains them, and she doesn't let them run up on the fence, and if they do bark, she makes them go inside. They're still out on the other side of the fence, though, and my dog is now scared and reacting in her own backyard. When my dog starts carrying on, she's the one who has to go inside. She already can't enjoy walks, and now she can't even enjoy being outside. I asked my neighbor if she'd consider a schedule for the dogs, so that my dog can enjoy her yard too, without the neighbor's dogs freaking her out on the other side of the fence. She was polite about it, but said no. She bought the house with a yard for her dogs, and they use it. She said she'd be glad to tell me when she's leaving with them for a period of hours, but otherwise, she's not going to change what she's doing day to day. So nothing changed, and her dogs get plenty of outdoor time, and mine gets none, except for the stray times when she takes one of her dogs to a training class or takes both of them for a hike. I'm really upset and want to insist that we adopt a schedule so that my dog can have some outside time too. Would I be the jerk if I insisted she worked with me to adopt a schedule that's fair to all of the dogs? Edit to clarify. My dog does not get the same opportunity as her dogs, not even close. Her dogs have free access five days a week, weeknights and weekends. My dog only gets outside time now when she says she's leaving for a class or a hike. If I let my dog out to sun herself at 10.30 on a Tuesday, sure enough, it won't be five minutes before she's letting her dogs out and then my dog freaks out and has to come in. She's not getting anywhere close to what they're getting. Edit again. The fence is a privacy fence. My dog freaks out when she can hear and smell the other dogs as well as see them. She can't see the dogs, but she knows they're there. You would be the jerk. You asked, accept her response. You don't get to police what other people do on their property. You're the jerk. You decided to adopt a reactive rescue dog, knowing very well you'll have a ton of work to do with her. You made that decision, 
not your neighbor. It's your job to make this dog comfortable, and your neighbor shouldn't have to suffer for your decisions. Imagine being the lady next door and buying or renting a house with a perfect backyard for your two dogs, only to find out she lives next to OP and needs to restrict her own backyard usage. OP, the problem here is your dog. The onus for figuring out a solution is squarely on you. The lady next door doesn't necessarily have to work with you. She is entitled to use her own yard as she sees fit. Your dog is the issue. You would be the jerk. Anybody have a dog of their own? If so, what's your dog's name? Please let us know right now in the comments below. My doggo's name was Cinny, and she was the best Rottweiler anyone could have ever asked for. I still have dreams about her to this day. F's in the chat for Cinny. Am I the jerk for not changing my house rules to accommodate my kids from a previous relationship? So I, 36 male, have two kids, who are 13 male and 10 female, from a previous relationship. I've been with my wife, who's 34, for 8 years. We have twin boys who are 5. We have had my older kids religiously the whole time on weekends and during school holidays. As they've gotten older, our house rules have differed from when they are at home with my ex. For example, bedtime is staggered by age at our house, and things like no dessert if they don't drink enough of their tea. With four kids, it's a busy household, and a few rules help with controlling our time and ensuring we can do things as a family. Anyway, over the last 12 months, when my older kids come over, they have expressed their dislike for some of our rules, mainly the no phones after lunch until after tea. They can have them on them and reply to messages and calls, however, it's just no sitting on social media. They can go on phones in the morning and after tea if we aren't out doing things. During the day, we try and do family activities, such as bowling or cinema or bike rides and such, or if we stay home, it's board games and just interacting as a family. As my older son is getting older, me and my wife understand his weekends he likes to be with his friends, and we will drop him off to where his friends are and pick him up at a set time, as we live on the other end of the city. However, now for the last three months, they have refused to come to our house due to these rules, and my ex asked me to compromise on these rules, which I declined mainly because it's not the most aggressive and archaic of rules, five to six hours of no phones. Plus, it will start the spiral for my twins, seeing that they can get away with whatever they want to if they express enough dislike. I've said the door will always be open for them, and I won't be forcefully making them come to our house. So, am I the jerk for not relaxing the rules so they can come over just to sit on their phones? I don't think it's too harsh, but I'm also feeling guilty that they don't want to come over anymore. With my ex, they're allowed to cut their own routine, and that's fine there as it isn't my house and whatever works for them. My wife agrees with our rules, which is for all of the kids and backs me 100%, but I find myself questioning if I'm doing the right thing or not. Edit, the five-year-olds do not have phones and they don't all follow the same exact rules as the older kids have their phones. They just can't sit scrolling for five hours in the middle of the day when we have made plans and made an effort to do something as a family. It's mainly one day a week too. The other day of the weekend, they're sitting with their friends and have their phones with them and can do as they please with said phones. It's just one day a week for five hours. You're the jerk. Your kids are unhappy at your home. That already tells you everything you need to know. Forced family time doesn't work on tweens and teens. It makes them resentful. You're the jerk. Five-year-olds and 13-year-olds shouldn't have the same rules. You're the jerk. You can't expect the same rules for a five-year-old to apply to a teenager. You made these rules to create a family bond, but you're pushing your family away by sticking to these rules. You can adjust the rules by age, but you refuse to because you're too stubborn. Your rigidity suggests you prefer to have your controllable little family of four rather than your original kids in your life. Your cute and easy twins will grow up and chafe at your rules too. You will drop them then because, one, you won't have younger kids behind them that you are forcing them to play happy family outing time with, and two, you'll see them as less disposable. Wake up, you're going to lose your older kids because you aren't morphing your parenting style as appropriate with their ages. They were your babies first, and you should care more about getting it right as a parent in the limited time you have with them generally, but also before they are adults. Needless to say, I think you're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. God forbid a guy wants his family to spend some time together. Look, OP, I've said it a thousand times, Reddit is the worst place to look for parenting advice. I mean seriously, one day a week for five hours, get off your phones and spend some time with your family. 
Am I the jerk for telling my parents I eat well and exercise regularly because I don't want to end up like them? I'm female 27. My parents are in their mid-60s and they have a ton of health issues for pretty much as long as I can remember. My dad has been at or above 300 pounds for my whole life, so he has the health issues that go along with long-term obesity. My mom, while not obese, has been overweight pretty much forever also and just narrowly avoided a massive heart attack after difficulty breathing while watching TV had emergency open heart surgery to deal with several blockages. Healthy meals growing up was pizza after a small salad. So when I moved out, I unlearned unhealthy food and exercise habits and learned new healthier habits. Props to my husband, male 27, who had those healthier habits and has been so helpful as I figure this stuff out. We recently visited my hometown and family for a week. We got guest passes for the local gyms because we both experience pretty brutal mental health declines if we don't work out at least some. My parents teased us a little for having to work out even on vacation, but I let it slide because I can see how it's a little silly from the outside looking in. Then we went out to my all-time favorite Italian place. I got baked ziti, which comes with a salad as an appetizer, which I did in fact eat. There was a snicker from my parents. I ignored it because I didn't realize it was aimed at me. Then the meal came and I only ate about a third of it, got the rest to go. We were going to be in town for four more days so I could reheat it and it wouldn't go to waste. We're waiting for the waitress to come back to sign the bills and then head out. And my dad says, Are you sure you're our daughter? The you that we know would have asked for seconds and wouldn't have even touched the salad. I said, I'm trying to be healthier. Nothing wrong with that. He doubled down and said they don't even recognize me anymore. They have no clue who I am because the kid they raised didn't think twice about the gym and now it seems to be my life with how much time I waste there and don't get them started on the supplements, pre-workout and protein powder, because that's a waste of money that we could be saving or putting towards our expenses or investing. So I told my parents, I'm making the most important investment I can make. I'm investing into my health, because I'd rather spend $200 a year on the gym and supplements than $200 a month on medication. Ouch, yowza canalza. Than $200 a month on medication I could have avoided being on if I had just been a little healthier in my younger days. My mom asks, what's that supposed to mean? And that's when I said, I'm making the lifestyle choices I am so I don't end up like you two. My genetics may be messed up, but I don't have to make it easy for them to win, so I'm not going to. Hugh outrage and insults hurled towards my husband and I. Waitress came back just at that moment, so my husband signed and we all dipped out. The barrage continued with texts, so I just muted my phone. I get they took it personally. There's really no other way to take it. But was I really that out of line? Here's my conflict with this sub. Is am I the jerk a am I right or wrong sub? Or is it the am I the jerk sub? Yes, you're right. You want to work out to avoid or mitigate long-term health problems that may or may not be genetic. Were your parents rude? Yes. Was what you said also rude? Yes. Everyone sucks here. Everyone sucks here. They're being unnecessarily interested and judgmental about your new diet and exercise choices. So yeah, they should back off that. Probably should stop making restaurants a big focus of socializing with you as well. But you know, you could have just explained your choices and lifestyle without adding, so I don't end up like you two. I guess you're the type of person that thinks anything goes as a response when someone has been rude to you first. Karen wants to use the shoulder lane to escape traffic. I dared her. This happened just a few hours ago. I was driving a semi on the highway when the traffic suddenly became bumper to bumper on a two lane due to an accident a couple miles ahead. Everybody was creeping and I was at the right lane. Suddenly, I saw a regular vehicle, not even an emergency vehicle, on the right side, the shoulder lane, passing me. There's not even an exit nearby. I was like, oh no. And as soon as I saw a couple vehicles behind me trying to do the same thing, I immediately blocked them by going slightly to the shoulder. So I'm occupying two lanes. I got a few honks, but I couldn't care less. If I'm suffering in traffic jams, everyone else should have to as well. Shoulder isn't for passing. As long as I didn't see any flashing lights behind me, I'm not opening that shoulder. We're crawling anyway. After a few hundred feet ahead, I see an idle police cruiser on the shoulder up ahead. Figured that nobody would dare using the shoulder anymore. I merged back to my lane. Turns out I was right. The shoulder became empty all of a sudden, but that's not the end. While I was chilling, still creeping, I heard a very annoying and repetitive honk on my left side. I looked and I saw this lady with huge sunglasses, a ponytail, bending down on her seat, looking at me, yelling something, looking outraged. 
I roll down the window and this is the following conversation. Karen, you know you're blocking two lanes, right? Me, confused. Huh? I was behind you on the right lane and you wouldn't move. I honked and you didn't care. Me, that's a shoulder. You're not supposed to drive on the shoulder. That's a lane. You are allowed to drive there. While she's still yelling incoherently, we are still slowly moving. Then I remembered there's an idle police cruiser on the shoulder that I saw a while back that we didn't pass yet. I'm sure everyone knows by now. Malicious compliance initiated. I reduced my speed even more, so Karen is faster than me by a little bit on the left lane. Then I dare her by giving her the signal that she can pass me to use the shoulder. She aggressively took it, cut in front of me, and immediately went to the shoulder. However, what Karen didn't know was that the cruiser is already around the corner. I was driving a semi, so my field of vision is much higher and wider than everyone else. Karen was driving a sedan. Her field of vision is much lower and limited. What I didn't take into account was how aggressive Karen was driving. She cut the corner so quick without looking and ended up hitting the cruiser. Sorry, officer. It was so abrupt that I can hear the crash pretty loudly. I can also tell that the driver in front of me was gasping in shock as well. I've never seen an officer get out of the cruiser so fast before. This dude practically jumped out of the cruiser in less than one second. Then, this is what I witnessed and heard when I'm creeping slowly with the traffic. Not wanting to miss anything, I roll down my passenger window. Officer, get out of the vehicle. Karen, still inside her car, full fluster mode. Officer, get out, now. Karen finally gets out and literally word per word. But I wasn't at fault. You were stopped in a lane. Officer, this is a shoulder for emergencies, not for your convenience to escape traffic jams. Karen, but... Incoherent sob story as I drove away from the scene. I couldn't hear what was going on anymore, but I kept watching my front as well as the side mirror. Judging from her body movement, she was indeed panicking while pointing at my truck. Don't know why. Then, before the scene disappeared from my mirror, the last thing I saw was the officer pulling out his handcuffs and handcuffing her. Surprisingly, she complied without causing any more scenes. Then I continued to drive into the sunset. Edit. For those who asked for a video from the dash cam, I honestly would have wanted to relive this moment as well. However, my company is too cheap to invest in dash cams. They said that a tracker system is good enough. I've been using my own dash cam for the first few days until it doesn't stick to the windshield anymore due to non-permanent truck assignment. If there's a truck dash cam that doesn't require sticking to the windshield, I'm willing to get it. Edit 2. Some people did share with me that I shouldn't block the shoulder. While I did pay attention to flashing lights for emergency vehicles, back then it didn't occur to me that some emergency could come from vehicles without flashing lights. Thank you for teaching me a valuable lesson, and yes, I would prefer 99 Karens to pass me illegally than causing one innocent person to get hurt. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.